Bonjour. I'm Chloe, and I live here in the French city of Toulouse. I'm working on my debut romance novel about a couple destined to be together despite all the hurdles they face. If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment. Boo! <laughs> Lost in your dumb fictional world again? If you like the sound of it, then leave a comment. <laughs> That's Cedric, my brother. But I doubt it, because we have nothing in common. And he's a massive pain in my... Uh -huh. Anyway... I guess you could say I'm introverted, and I dream of becoming a best-selling romance novelist, making a living out of doing what I love. Only, dreams don't always go to plan, and publishing houses don't seem to like my drafts. Meanwhile, Cedric is Satan in disguise, whose sole purpose is making my life miserable. He turned off my alarm and made me late for a meeting, changed all of my contacts' names to emojis, and one time, I woke up to see my laptop covered all in plastic wrap. The problem was, he got away with being a jerk simply because he was deemed good-looking. In his fangirl's eyes, he could do no wrong. Living with Cedric was such an endurance test, so I avoided him the best I could by going to a private school, instead of the same public school as him. Everything was fine, until our parents lost everything in stocks, and we had no choice but to move into this teeny, tiny house. One night, I went downstairs to get some water and saw Mom and Dad up late with bills piled up around them. Seeing them like that made me desperately want to help. So the next day, I told them that the public school had a creative writing club and that I wanted to transfer there. My tuition fees weren't a burden anymore, but going to the same school as Cedric was not ideal. So I insisted that he acted like he didn't know me at all. Still, the first few days were terrible as I kept getting lost and felt so out of place. I hardly looked up and only identified other students by their shoes. Thank goodness for the pink and white sneaker girl, Emma. She was the only person who actually noticed me, and when I told her about my writing dreams, she was really supportive. We became best friends and could chat about everything, even my annoying brother. Things were better at school, but not at home. My parents were still struggling to hide their money problems, and Cedric... Well, was just being Cedric. Couldn't he see that now wasn't the time for his clown antics? I helped out as much as I could by cleaning, doing laundry, preparing meals, and even got a part-time job in a patisserie. While he literally did nothing. Why can't you stop fooling around? Chill out, sis. Even when you have a mare, all the stress will give you gray hair. Fine, act like a moron and stay in this moronic place forever. I'll get our old house back alone. After a busy shift, I just wanted to get home and go straight to bed. Only when walking along the curb, I spotted Cedric doing some dumb, noisy performance. Ugh, such a laughable, selfish bum. I had to seriously hold back or else my fist would definitely land on his face. Oh, I still had the last chapter to finish. My body was ready to shut down, but I couldn't slack. Not if I wanted to complete it by Louis Beaumont's book launch. He's my favorite author. I'd planned for months to fly to Nice and hand him my manuscript. Suddenly, the lights went out. Guys, looks like the electricity company cut us off because of those unpaid bills. Gosh, we can't live like this. So I pulled out some money from the back of the manuscript. This was money for my Nice trip. But this is more urgent. So I gotta do what I have to do. Mom, Dad, here's some money. Just to help out a bit. The next day, Cedric barged into my room with a smug grin on his face. Guess who's going to Paris? Try not to miss me too much, will ya? What? B but where did you get your money from? Mom and Dad? Duh. Check it out. That's my money? I can't believe this. We don't even have electricity, but they gave him money to go mess around in Paris? I shoved him out of my room and slammed the door shut. I'd always tried my best to not disappoint them, yet they favored my deadbeat brother and spoiled him rotten. All this family stuff was eating me up, so on school day, I confided in Emma. Only when I tried talking to her, she seemed distracted and kept drifting with the music. Em, Em, are you listening? Oh, sorry, but this beat is straight up fire. Look, he's the winner of this contest. Isn't he amazing and talented? I looked at her phone and saw, what? Cedric? So he came to Paris for this stupid contest? Don't talk about him, okay? That's my selfish, uncaring brother I've always talked about. Be his fan, and we can't be friends anymore. Things got even worse when Cedric went home and literally made it rain with his reward money. Chloe, look at all of this money your brother won. Thanks to his talent, we can go back to our old house. Ugh, why is everything so easy for Cedric? He did some nonsense rap and became a celebrity? Meanwhile, it's me who had to give up my trip, my dream. At least we got the old house back, but day after day, these annoying reporters are driving me crazy. 
How did you come up with meaningful lyrics? Meaningful? Everyone knows rap isn't actually music. It's just some noise full of swearing and insults. Yeah, ignore her. She's just cranky from skipping breakfast. There's no escaping Cedric's name, not even at school. Please, please, please introduce me to him. Why are you so obsessed with him? Don't you remember anything I said about how terrible he is? Come on, give his music a try. I can't believe someone who wrote such beautiful lyrics can be as bad as you say he is. Fine. If she wanted to meet him, then I'd grant her that wish. It's about time she saw his true face. I opened the door and showed Emma inside when suddenly we were covered in a cloud of confetti. Why the long face? My grand welcome was the bomb. Do you know how long it would take to clean this mess? Ugh. Em, this is my brother. An idiot. Idiot brother. Em. But then I turned around to see Emma already soaking up Cedric's every word. I can't take this anymore. My time would be better spent writing. Trembling thoughts. Through fear, your eyes will find mine. Love will bind us like a cat's nine lives. Wow, that's perfect. Wait, that voice sounds unfamiliar. Oh my, this guy was heartthrob level handsome. Bonjour, I'm Pierre, Cedric's colleague. Is he home? Yes, let me show you the way. What are you seeking him for? We're collaborating on my next album, so I'm here to practice. As a senior singer, I also helped Cedric build his show and industry connections. He's superb, isn't he? After that day, Pierre visited my house more often. Turns out he's a sweet and gentle guy who always brought us gifts, such as flowers and scented candles. And after dinner, he even helped me wash up. How can such an angel work with my devil brother? One day when I was out with Emma, suddenly she looped her arm around me and said, You sure seem chirper these days. It's probably because Cedric's often away on music shows. You're telling me it has nothing to do with Pierre? Come on, Chloe, it's written all over your face. Fine. He's really sweet, and his smile is as bright as the sun. How can I approach someone like him? Hmm, why not start with a love letter? I took Emma's advice and wrote the most romantic letter ever, then brought it to his company. If anyone asks, I'll say I'm here to see my brother. Huh? Are they arguing? I went over to Pierre and asked him what had happened. Oh, it's nothing really. Cedric is just stressed out from his busy schedule. Yeah, right. As if there was anything stressful about this nonsense rap thing. Now is my moment. So I stuffed the letter in Pierre's hand, then ran away. I was still giddy with excitement when I arrived home. Only Cedric ruined my mood by sitting there looking like he'd swallowed a wasp. Oh no, are all showbiz parties too tiring? What a tragedy. Shut it, Chloe. What does a dreamer like you know? Dreamer? At least I'm not a self-centered, shallow idiot. I sacrificed everything so you could go after your dumb rap career. And all you do is act like an ungrateful jerk. Grow up and stop being so childish. I expected him to shout back at me, but instead he gave me this dead look, then trudged off to his room. He didn't come down for dinner or anything for the next three days. Hmm, this house sure was quiet without him. But he's a chill guy and things will go back to normal soon, right? I guess I should just enjoy the peace while I could. The next day, Emma showed up at my house all worked up. Is Cedric here? He didn't answer any texts and calls. Huh? You two are messaging each other? Uh, um, I just wonder if he's okay. How typical of you to talk to him behind my back. To my surprise, Emma just impatiently barred past me and ran up to Cedric's room. Then she reappeared with a note. Cedric's gone. Jeez, how irresponsible and impulsive. He really doesn't care about anyone but himself. Enough! I won't listen to you badmouth your brother anymore. Can't you see he's seriously struggling and showing signs of depression? Who's the one who doesn't care about family here? And you really believe you're better than him? Emma's outburst left me stunned. Is Cedric really depressed? How was I meant to know that when he's always goofing around? That evening, Mom and Dad kept fretting about Cedric's disappearance. He gave his all to help us while we could do nothing to help him. Remember those days he performed on the streets? He gave us all the money he earned, and he always tried to cheer us up when things were down. Cedric only wanted to join the rap contest to win some more money. He was very nervous, but we believed in him, so we gave him the money to enter. Oh God, so I misunderstood him all along? Suddenly I remembered his winning track that Emma insisted that I listen to. I went up to my room and turned it on. It's about us, his beloved family. Turns out he wasn't a deadbeat idle loser like I thought he was. He always puts on a happy face to lift other spirits while quietly struggling with his own demons. I needed to find him and apologize immediately. 
so I went to Pierre for help. I had no idea he was struggling so badly. I should have noticed that he was suffering and not overloaded him with work. But there's an important show coming. If Cedric was a no-show, he'd be in breach of his contract and have to pay a huge sum in compensation. Oh no, that's not good. What should we do now? You know what? You look a lot like Cedric. How about you disguise as him? But how? Don't worry, our makeup team is top-notch. Nobody's gonna know. This all sounded crazy, but it seemed like I had no other choice. My family couldn't be in debt again for this. Being this close to Pierre made my heart flutter. He took me for my makeover, then I learned to lip sync and perform on stage. I even tried to walk and talk like my brother. I felt bad about deceiving his fans, but I couldn't risk Cedric getting into big trouble. It's only a one-time thing. Sometimes I lip sync too. It's no big deal. I felt a bit confused. Then suddenly, a stage crew member above me accidentally dropped a wrench. It could have knocked me off if Pierre didn't swoop in and save the day. Now, back to practicing, and oh boy, was it hectic. Pierre stayed with me the whole time and was really supportive. We also never stopped trying to look for Cedric together. I felt our connection growing, but couldn't figure out why he hadn't made any move. Maybe my first letter hadn't been clear enough, so I sneaked into Pierre's room and left him another one. Only later that day, I saw him glued to his phone, so I took a glance. Huh? He was messaging somebody with a very cheesy nickname. Right, he wasn't interested because he was already dating someone else. Oh no, I have to reclaim my second letter before humiliating myself. I ran into his room but couldn't find it anywhere. Wait, what's this? Here comes the big night. I was absolutely terrified. Pierre smiled sweetly at me and held my hands. We shared a look, then stepped on stage together. There were so many people out there. My legs felt numb, but then I spotted Emma beaming at me from the front row, and my nerves eased again. I quickly found the beat, then lip-synced and danced perfectly. But halfway through the song, the stage light suddenly went off and a shadowy figure walked toward me. Cedric! The audience oohed and awed, then clapped in excitement as Cedric continued the rest of the performance. During the break, everyone went backstage and saw Pierre grab Cedric's arm. Cedric, where have you been? We've all been worried sick. Drop the act. You're just using me to make yourself rich, forcing me to do show after show, and when I was exhausted, you pushed lip syncing onto me. What are you talking about? These shows are to help you gain support. Starting out in this industry is hard. Hey, I even lent you some money to get your house back. You mean the money you used to tie my brother in with a stupid contract? You compelled Cedric to work exclusively with you, performing two years for free to clear his debt. But according to these receipts for each show, the money he should have received already exceeded the amount he owed you. W what the? Surprised much? Now we have all the evidence against you. So what? Cedric signed it anyway. A contract is a contract. Break it and I'll get you kicked out of the company and make sure you never get any show again. Your whole family will be dirt poor alike before. I don't think so. What would the public say if they knew you've been flirting with him all along, and when he rejected you, you manipulated and overworked him until he agreed to date you? Uh, how long have you known? Long enough to expose you. Now, you have two options. One, cancel the contract within the next 24 hours and pay my brother the excess money you exploited from him. Or two, we'll publish what you did and see if you survive in showbiz afterward. I don't hate you for having feelings for me, but this deal is not fair. Pierre looked nervous and angry, then just stormed off. I turned to my annoying, goofy brother and gave him a big hug. I'm sorry for misunderstanding you before. Why didn't you tell us that you borrowed money to get back our house? I know how much you wanted our house back, so I joined the contest, but the prize money wasn't enough. That's when I asked Pierre. Silly me. If you hadn't found the contract and receipts, I would have still believed his lies and worked till exhaustion. So you did get my message. I was about to shut off all connections to the world. But that day I felt super uneasy, so I opened my phone and saw your message. Must be sibling telepathy. One more thing. Emma, you truly helped me find myself again. What do you say? Do you want to be a superstar rapper's girlfriend? Yes, I do! Please keep the lovey-dovey stuff to a minimum in front of me. Luckily, I was spared when a stage crew called Cedric to go back on stage. You know, it's not easy for us artists to have a big platform, literally like the stage. We always have a price to pay for the glory. Because of that, I'm eternally grateful for my amazing family and friends who always have my back. And a big shout out to my sister for being my inspiration for this song. Then he started rapping to my poetry. His rhymes and my poems are flowing, really getting the crowd going. 
She's a lyrical gymnastic genius. After the show, Cedric received a video from Pierre. Cedric, I'm sorry for taking advantage of you. I like you so much and wanted to keep you close. I'll pay back what I owe you, then take a break from showbiz for a while. I really hope one day you can forgive me. Phew, all that drama was a lot for my introverted self to handle. So now, I've treated myself to some me time to recharge. Thanks to Cedric rapping, dozens of my publishers reached out to me for my poems, including those who'd previously rejected me. <sighs> Gosh, am I seeing it wrong? A male from Louis Beaumont himself? I can't wait to see him in person. And you keep working on your dream. Perhaps a secret angel is on the way to bring you a wonderful opportunity. I'm Meg, and I'm just your standard 21-year-old college girl. Well, at least I thought I was. My story begins normally enough. I had this huge crush on a guy who was in his senior year. He's called Ian, and he's funny, sweet, and extremely attractive. I've noticed him since my first year here, but it's only recently that I think he's started to notice me, too. College life meant that our paths crossed in the campus, coffee house, the corridors, the library, and at house parties, so he did know my name at least. So it's not the kind of pathetic crush when they don't even know that you exist. Now, whenever he sees me in these places, we smile and say hey to each other, and his eyes always linger on me that split second longer. I really figured that his lingering looks meant he had a crush on me too, and I had a chance with him. I'd been in the cheer team back in high school, but initially, I was unsure about joining the team at college, as my workload's so intense. But Ian's a massive sports fanatic, and he's on the football team, so... I joined the cheerleading team to have an excuse to be close to him, as the cheer practice had the same schedule as the football team. My plan worked, and we started talking more. So, okay, it was only small talk. Stuff like, hey, how was practice, and it's the perfect weather for practice, isn't it? Well, they might not have won conversation of the year, but it was a start. Besides, sweaty end-of-practice chats didn't put me at my flirting prime as it's hard to maintain cuteness when my hair was stuck to my forehead. Talking to him gave me a buzz and meant that I couldn't sleep that night. To celebrate their awesome season ranking, the football team planned a party. Of course, they'd invited the cheerleaders, but as a newbie, I was nervous about going along, as I didn't know anyone all that well. After the practice, I was walking home when a familiar voice shouted, Wait up! behind me. I spun around to see that it was Ian. As delighted as I was, I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was being watched. I looked over to the right a bit and saw a woman in a black luxury car was staring at me. But as soon as I spotted her, she closed the car window and looked away. That was a bit strange, but I couldn't care less about it, as my crush was standing right in front of me. You're coming to the party, right? Bring your friends over too. The more the merrier. Ian smiled at me. I stood there in a daze, but I managed to nod and said, Yeah, sure. He quickly walked away, but didn't forget to turn back to tell me, See you tonight. I got jelly legs and had to lean on the closest wall to me to balance myself. Was this real? I pinched myself, and it was totally real. Ian technically just asked me out, right? Then I noticed something. Ian got into the passenger side of the black car with the strange staring woman. This was odd. I mean, who was she? Maybe she was his aunt or something, and she'd only been staring weirdly at me as he'd told her all about me? Excitement overruled my uneasy feeling. I rushed home so I could plan out my outfit. On my way back, I called up my best friend Liv. Ian told me to bring a friend, and who else would I bring? Liv is my best friend. We're inseparable. She often sits out in the field waiting for me to finish my cheerleading practice and smiles over at me when she sees Ian chatting to me. I told Liv to come pick me up. I didn't want to drive because I think I'll be leaving with Ian later anyway, and if that's the case, Liv could drive home herself. We got to the house party. Everyone was having fun. Liv quickly blended in on the dance floor. I tried to enjoy it too, but couldn't help but look around, searching for Ian, the only reason why I was there. As I was lurking, I also met eyes with a very cute guy. He kept on looking at me. As cute as he was, my sights were firming set on Ian. After what seemed like ten laps of the cramped house, I finally found Ian. 
he's walking in with a red solo cup in hand, casually fist bumping everyone. It's like there's a halo around him. He's so hot. He walked towards me and was really friendly. Then Liv appeared by my side and gave me a hug. Ian asked Liv lots of questions, which I thought was sweet. He was making an effort with my friend, which made him so thoughtful and polite. Now that I knew Ian was around, I could finally relax and enjoy the party a bit. Then I went to the backyard to get some beer for me and Liv. I came back inside carrying the beers. Liv had moved, so I went in search of her. That's when I found her kissing someone by the staircase. Firstly, I felt excited for her. My bestie was kissing a cute boy. But then I realized that the boy she was kissing had the same light wash denim jeans on as Ian and the same perfectly styled hair. Wait a minute. It was Ian! My best friend in the whole world was kissing the boy I liked. I was so upset I dropped the beers, then ran outside in tears. I sat on the curb feeling devastated. How could Liv do this to me? I looked up through teary eyes and noticed that further up the road, there was a luxury black vehicle parked up. That was weird. Was it the same vehicle as before? I went to the football team party certain that I was finally going to hook up with my crush Ian. Only, I found Ian kissing my best friend Liv. Now, I was sitting outside on the curb feeling dreadful. Jeez, this night sucked. I stared at the black vehicle. Why was it following me? Maybe I should go and check it out. Suddenly, a hand tapped my shoulder. Startled, I turned around and saw that it was Ian. Thank you so much, Meg, for setting me up with Liv. Don't worry, I'll definitely pay you back. How about lunch on Sunday? My treat. He winked, then walked off. I sat there, open-mouthed. Was he serious? He hadn't even noticed that I was crying. What a jerk. I felt like I was about to blow. My sobbing increased. I felt so rejected. So does that mean he didn't like me, but he liked Liv? Had he ever liked me? What was wrong with me? Worse still, Liv knows I have a massive crush on him, but she still kissed him? I felt so betrayed. I'd lost both my crush and best friend in the same night. This party was terrible! Suddenly, I remembered the black vehicle, so I looked over to where it was, only it wasn't there anymore. I shrugged. I had bigger things to deal with right now than some weirdo in a posh car. The tears wouldn't stop. I was basically a waterfall. I wiped them onto the back of my arm, but this didn't help much. Someone sat down next to me. A guy. Hey, what's wrong? He asked. Through blurry eyes, I realized that it was the cute guy who'd been eyeing me up earlier at the party. I was too upset to reply to him, so I just sat there crying and shivering, which wasn't a good look. He took his jacket off and placed it around my shoulders. I can't have you freezing to death on my conscience. He smiled. His smile was infectious, and even through my tears, I found myself smiling too. Whatever it is, you shouldn't let it ruin your night. You're here now, so you should have a good time. This guy was right. Liv and Ian were certainly having a great time, so why should I be the one sat here miserable? I didn't need Ian or Liv, so they were both welcome to each other. I was at this lame party now, and I didn't have my car with me, so I was stuck here. I may as well make the most of it. Let's get a drink, I blubbered out. I wiped my tears, and the guy helped me up, and we went inside. Jackpot for me. He's very cute. His name's Nick, and he's friends with one of the guys on the football team. I spent the rest of the party with Nick. We danced around and played party games. Turns out I sucked at beer pong, so I ended up quite tipsy from all the beer I had to down. I felt tired and wanted to go home, but how on earth could I sit in the same car as that traitor Liv? Talk about the most awkward car journey home ever. I couldn't put myself through it. Then Nick offered me a ride home. I acted shy, but agreed. I mean, who could say no to him? Besides, he'd cheered me up tonight. I told him the address and dozed off a bit in the back seat, then woke up just in time to tell him to turn left at the next intersection. Then it'd be my house. But to my horror, he sped up and drove past it. 
confused, I told him that we needed to make a U-turn, but he just ignored me and smirked. I panicked. Then I yelled at him, What are you doing? Suddenly, he answered the phone. I heard a female voice on the other end. I stayed quiet to listen, but couldn't tell what she was saying. He replied, Yes, I've got her here. We're on the way. Was I really being kidnapped? I needed to find a way to get out. I thought about calling my sister to help pick me up, and I'd jump out of the car at a red stop. I called her and whispered to her the situation and to come find me at the gas station we're about to pass by. I didn't hang up just yet. I told Nick, I've already told my sister. If you don't release me now, she'll call the police. He looked taken aback. My plan did work a little, but not enough to make him stop the car. I had to switch to plan B, jumping out of the car. From now till we get to the gas station, there would be three red stops, and I'd have to brace myself to jump, or else we'd get to the highway and there would be no turning back. First, it was a green light. Second one, I had my hands on the car door handle, but was too scared to open it. Third one, I had to do this now or never. As we approached the lights, I closed my eyes and was about to do it. Then he suddenly turned left. I panicked. He stopped the car and told me to get out. Confused, I froze. Then his phone rang again. I saw the pic of the caller. It's a woman. Seems a little familiar. As the phone rang, he yelled at me to get out again. I quickly opened the door and fell to the ground. He drove away immediately. I sobbed out to my sister on the phone, and through my fear, I tried explaining what had just happened. With my shaking hands, I managed to share my location with her. Then I walked to try and find some place with bright lights to wait for her. I was in total panic mode until I got home. As I calmed down a bit, I started to put things together and wondered why he did this to me. And then, it came to my mind that the caller was the woman in the black luxury car I saw that afternoon. Then, this means it all had something to do with Ian. Is it because she thought I was Ian's girlfriend or something? But when she found out I wasn't, she ordered my release? If Ian has something to do with this, then that means Liv could now be in danger. Should I warn her, or is it now that traitor's problem, not mine? I'm mad with her, but I don't want anything bad to happen to her. I don't know what this is all about. What should I do now? Ew, there's a fly in my drink. That's so gross. I'm not paying for this. The kid shoved the cup of lemonade in my hand, then ran away. I just saw you drop it in, and it's not even a real fly. Hey, stop! I shouted after him, but it was too late. He'd gone, and now so had the rest of my customers. Dang it, that was the third time this week, and I knew exactly who was behind this. Michael! I glared over the fence, then charged towards his lemonade stand. Seeing his fake grin, I got even more furious that I poured the cup of lemonade over his sneakers, snatched a dollar bill out of his hand, and then walked off. You see, I'm Amy, and I'm the kind of girl who knows what she wants and gets what she wants. And what I want is for Mike to admit defeat and stop messing with my business. Ugh! I've been on this mission for the past 10 years. I kid you not, it's a literal war between us. It's not fun and games at all, especially now that we have our parents involved in this. You see, my parents and his parents are best friends. In fact, they're so close that I'm pretty sure back in the day, our moms planned their pregnancies together. So me and Mike were born only a week apart. And of course, I was born before him. So there's that. I've won right from the first round. In your face, Mikey. But even worse than the joint birthday parties, shared vacations, and being classmates with him for over a dozen years, I have to live next door to him too. Yep, our parents deliberately moved in next door as they thought raising us together would be fun. They dreamed of us being the best of friends like them. Ugh, no chance. Instead, our disliking for each other began at an early age. Whenever Mike came over, he would throw my Barbie dolls across the room, cut the hair off of them, 
or wrap my dollhouse in toilet paper. So I retaliated by turning his room into a Lego minefield. Ha! <laughs> and then I drew flowers on his stupid face while he was napping. Our parents put this down to the cute little things kids did, but nothing about this was cute. This meant war. Our feud heated up once we started to go to school. Everything was a contest between us, from grades, school activities, and even just for the window seat on the school bus. Once, before the summer holiday started, our teachers suggested that over the break, we could have fun helping out our parents with some useful activities, like making homemade goods and selling them in our front yard. Upon hearing that, I caught Mike's challenging look and knew that this meant one thing. Okay then, game on. On the first day, I got up early to set up my lemonade stand out in my front yard. But then I looked to my left and guess what I saw in dear Mikey's yard? Yep, a lemonade stand. Ooh, why did he have to be such a copycat? We both seemed to attract lots of customers, but I don't know if it was just me, but it seemed like he was selling more than me. So over the summer, I used my profits to upgrade my lemonade stand little by little, with eye-catching decorations, promotions, and I even added lemon snow cones to my menu. Finally, my queue seemed notably longer than Mike's. The snow cones were doing the trick. But then, a loud speaker sounded out from next door. Come and try my new iced tea, handmade using my secret recipe. Try it today at an introductory half-price offer. To my utter dismay, most of the people in my queue left and went over to Mike's stand. Oof, the sneak. Then worse, he started blasting out catchy tunes to catch people's attention. That summer ended, but it had kickstarted the entrepreneur dreams in our little hearts. So throughout the next summer breaks, we continued to grow our businesses. I expanded my stand to sell a selection of drinks, snacks, and fast foods, with delivery service too. Once, with my friend's help, we even included a car washing service. Another time, we opened a little creche in our garden so busy parents could drop their kids off for a couple of hours and also grab a drink to go while they were there. Sounds good, right? But you know what? Whatever I sold, whatever I did, a couple of days later, Mike went and did the exact same thing. And then he had the cheek to accuse me of copying his ideas. Ugh, he was so annoying. Anyway, now at 17, what started out as a fun hobby expanded so much that I opened a mini diner in my garage. At first, it just made sense, as it meant I had customers regardless of the weather. Plus, there were also a few tables outside, and not to brag, but the seats were rarely empty. But then, of course, you guessed it. Mike went and turned his garage into a mini diner, too. Oof! Our diners became well-known hotspots in our neighborhood and they proved so popular that our parents continued to run them all year round. I was mad that whatever I did, Mike went and did it too. Then, to bug me further, he sent his friends around on a Saturday, and they just sat there taking up all of the seats, while only ordering Cokes. So, I sent my friend Cynthia around to his diner, and she pretended to have food poisoning after eating their food. Then she proceeded to fake gag and ran to the restroom back and forth until the customers all freaked out and left. But then he started to spread negative feedback about our place on the internet, and I did the same in return. Ugh, there's no ending to this fight ever! But I will never back down. I knew Mike had a huge crush on this Stacy girl in his science class, and one time after school, I saw him leading her into his house probably to bore her senseless bragging about his lousy business again. So I quickly put on makeup and changed into a cute dress. It's showtime, baby. I went over to Mike's house right on time to see him serve Stacy some of his restaurant signature dishes. I put on an act and jumped on him. You're cheating on me with this girl? She has nothing on me. How could you? I continued to make a scene pulling on Mike's hair and screaming until Stacy looked super awkward and made an excuse to leave. Result! But uh-oh, Mike didn't seem to see the funny side of this, 
I'd actually never seen him look this mad before. His ears went bright red. Then he shouted at me. Amy, competition or not, have I ever interfered in your private life? You've crossed the line this time. He knocked over the drink he'd made for Stacy, then sneered as he walked away. Seeing as you let yourself in, you can let yourself out. So, seemed like I'd won this round, but why didn't it feel good at all? And more like, embarrassing? After that, Mike wouldn't even look me in the eye. Whatever. I mean, he would soon mellow down and mess with my business again anyway. Right? Then one day after school, I arrived home to find my parents sitting with some strange, professional-looking man. They called me over to join them, then the man told me how he wanted to open a well-known fast food franchise in the neighborhood. Upon seeing me looking not really interested in what he was saying, he snidely remarked, Come on, you get what I mean. It'd be ridiculous to have three fast food restaurants all in the same place, right? And let's face it, yours is just some fun little kitty's hobby, which will never go anywhere. Take this. He held out an envelope. And go focus on your grades. Just leave business to the adults. Furious, I snatched the envelope off of him. Yep, it was full of dollar bills. How dare he try and bribe me? What a jerk. So I threw it back at him, then stormed off. Think about it, Amy. The man shouted after me. Don't go making a decision you'll come to regret. The next day, when I arrived home from school, the man was sitting in my diner eating my awesome pancakes. Ugh, why couldn't he get the hint? I stormed over and told him to leave. He grinned at me, then said, Hmm, these are good. You know, I think there's room for both of our businesses. All you have to do is take some items off your menu. He gestured to the pancakes. And spread some rumors about Mike's diner's hygiene not being up to scratch to close it down, and I'll let you keep your diner. Seeing my confused look, he added another push. I'm only telling you this because I know you're a smart girl. Smarter than that boy. So, choose wisely. Well, that's true. I am smarter than Mike, but this was crazy. I spent all evening considering it. I mean, there's no way I could compete against a big-name franchise. But this way, I stood some sort of a chance, right? But as annoying as Mike was, could I really do this to him? At 2 a.m., I sat up in bed, still so torn about this all. I rushed next door and threw a stone at Mike's window. The light in his room turned on right away. Obviously, he was having a sleepless night, too. He looked out and saw me, then he joined me on the porch, and we sat there in silence for a good while. Then he spoke up. Ames, your pancake tower is amazing. Really? Sighing, I replied, Honestly, I drool just thinking about your double-deck burger. But if we don't take those dishes off our menus, I think that man will find a way to close us down. He shook his head. Well, the Ames I know wouldn't quit that easily, right? I let out another long sigh. Yeah, but this is different. They're a big-name franchise. Our small little dining wouldn't be able to hold up for long. Sooner or later... Then we fell back into this despairing silence. I say we can do it. We can do it together! Mike suddenly stood up and pointed at our houses. We have plenty of space to open up one big diner! Ha! <laughs> what do you say? Me and him working together? Would that ever work? But... Well, nothing's impossible for big girl Amy. I grinned at him. Bring it on. Let's fight till our last breath. So the very next day, we joined forces and started preparing for the opening of the joint diner. Naturally, our parents were, of course, thrilled with the idea. They happily broke down the fences and even built a joint corridor to connect our houses together. We're now officially registered as one business and have all of our food, safety, and hygiene certificates. You know, the boring but official stuff. As for the franchise man, it turns out people in town are loyal to us. So when the story of his dirty trick spread out, everyone said they'd boycott his restaurant if he ever opened it. 
so we never heard from him again. Huh, that's karma for you. And what happened next? Well, Mike and I are still running our business together, and it's going pretty well so far. It's a real family affair, with everyone helping out. Actually, it turns out running our own business together is far more fun than competing against each other. Maybe Mike isn't as bad as I always made him out to be. And sometimes, I still claim myself to be his girlfriend when I catch a girl lurking around him. I guess he should learn to get used to having only one girl in his life. And thinking about it, I suppose that's always been me. I work as a waitress in a restaurant, and I can safely say that the term the customer is always right is definitely wrong. The way some customers act is ridiculous. It's like they're from a different planet at times. I love my job, but I dislike these awkward customers. Looking back on it, I realize that I have plenty of bizarre and funny stories, so I'm going to share the funniest ones with you. One time, this guy insisted he needed lime juice for his meal. As we're an Italian restaurant, we don't have any on hand, but I knew that the bar should have some. I politely told him that the kitchen didn't have any, but the bar uses them with the bottles of Peroni, so I might be able to get him some from there. He looked up at me and asked, Are you going to charge me for that? I smiled and replied, I think I can get a garnish for you for free. When I came back with the lime, he didn't thank me. Instead, he gave me a confused look. Where's my Peroni? He demanded. Sorry, sir? You said you wanted the lime. Did you want to order a bottle of Peroni as well? Yes, I want one. You said you wouldn't charge me. As soon as I told him I couldn't give him a free drink, he was furious and demanded that I get my manager. I went and got my boss and filled him in on what had happened. This man started shouting at him and insisted that I'd promised him a free bottle of Peroni with his slice of lime, and he wanted it right now. My boss managed to defuse the situation, but the man insisted that he'd never be coming back. He also didn't leave a tip, which, I guess, wasn't surprising. Another time, a group of customers walked in and ordered drinks. One member of the group asked for water, ice, and sugar. I thought this was odd, but I was used to customers asking for strange things, so I brought him what he asked for. He then took slices of orange out of his backpack and made all the things up himself like a bartender. Then he had a free orange juice. Another time, it was pretty late after closing, and I was waiting for the last table to finish eating so I could clean up. In the meantime, I was doing some other closing work on the other side of the restaurant and glancing occasionally over my shoulder to see if they needed something. The woman had almost finished her spag bowl when I saw her take something out of her pocket and drop it onto her plate. The woman stormed over to me and held out the plate. She pointed at something that was in the sauce and demanded to see my boss, so I went and got him. This woman actually delved into the spag bowl sauce and pulled out a dead, small cockroach and she then began to dangle it in front of us. I shrieked out and took a step back. She threatened to report us to environmental health, refused to pay, and then demanded a free meal voucher. If she really had found a cockroach in her meal, why would she want a free voucher to come back again? I told my boss that I saw her put it in her meal, so he asked her to wait while he checked the camera. She went completely bonkers and spat out racial slurs, profanities, and awful threats at us. My boss remained calm and politely asked them to pay and then leave. They kept refusing to pay. It was only when my boss said he'd called the police that her husband reluctantly paid for the meal. The whole thing was ridiculous. Who would carry a dead cockroach around with them just to get free food? Yuck! My most memorable customer was a woman in her 30s. She was polite at first and told me that she would just order a drink for now as the friend she was meeting was running late. I went and got her a glass of wine, and then I went to a nearby table to take their orders. I turned and looked over at her. She smiled at me. Then she picked up her wine and purposely poured it over her lap. She screamed out and jumped up to her feet. Both me and another waitress rushed over to her. She pointed over at me. It was her! She poured my wine all over me! I'm sorry, madam, but I wasn't even near you, I replied in the calmest tone I could manage. Are you calling me a liar? She screamed out. This is an outrage. My designer dress is ruined. Everyone in the restaurant was staring over at us. It was really embarrassing. 
Also, there was no way her dress was designer as my sister owned the same dress and it cost her $20. My boss came over and tried to calm the woman down. I passed her some napkins to dry herself with and my boss gave her a large wine on the house. He also said that he wouldn't charge her for the first one and her bill would be discounted 30% in total as an apology. Suddenly, the woman went from angry to polite. She thanked my boss, then she sat back down and looked at the menu. Ten minutes later, her friend showed up, and this woman ordered a three-course meal and acted as if nothing had happened. She even left me a tip. If I ever gain access to a time machine, the first thing I will do is go back, find the person who coined the customer is always right saying, and bring them back to watch this video. Then ask them if they want to correct their words. They certainly aren't always right. They just think that they are. My job can be challenging at times, but I enjoy being a waitress. Luckily for me, the majority of my customers are lovely. I hope my funny stories made you laugh. They didn't feel funny at the time, but now when I look back at them, I smile. After all, if you don't laugh, you'll cry, and no one wants to do that. I work as a waitress in a restaurant, and I can safely say that the term the customer is always right is definitely wrong. The way some customers act is ridiculous. It's like they're from a different planet at times. I love my job, but I dislike these awkward customers. Looking back on it, I realize that I have plenty of bizarre and funny stories, so I'm going to share the funniest ones with you. One time, this guy insisted he needed lime juice for his meal. As we're an Italian restaurant, we don't have any on hand, but I knew that the bar should have some. I politely told him that the kitchen didn't have any, but the bar uses them with the bottles of Peroni, so I might be able to get him some from there. He looked up at me and asked, Are you going to charge me for that? I smiled and replied, I think I can get a garnish for you for free. When I came back with the lime, he didn't thank me. Instead, he gave me a confused look. Where's my Peroni? He demanded. Sorry, sir? You said you wanted the lime. Did you want to order a bottle of Peroni as well? Yes, I want one. You said you wouldn't charge me. As soon as I told him I couldn't give him a free drink, he was furious and demanded that I get my manager. I went and got my boss and filled him in on what had happened. This man started shouting at him and insisted that I'd promised him a free bottle of Peroni with his slice of lime, and he wanted it right now. My boss managed to defuse the situation, but the man insisted that he'd never be coming back. He also didn't leave a tip, which, I guess, wasn't surprising. Another time, a group of customers walked in and ordered drinks. One member of the group asked for water, ice, and sugar. I thought this was odd, but I was used to customers asking for strange things, so I brought him what he asked for. He then took slices of orange out of his backpack and made all the things up himself like a bartender. Then he had a free orange juice. Another time, it was pretty late after closing, and I was waiting for the last table to finish eating so I could clean up. In the meantime, I was doing some other closing work on the other side of the restaurant and glancing occasionally over my shoulder to see if they needed something. The woman had almost finished her spag bowl when I saw her take something out of her pocket and drop it onto her plate. The woman stormed over to me and held out the plate. She pointed at something that was in the sauce and demanded to see my boss, so I went and got him. This woman actually delved into the spag bowl sauce and pulled out a dead, small cockroach, and she then began to dangle it in front of us. I shrieked out and took a step back. She threatened to report us to environmental health, refused to pay, and then demanded a free meal voucher. If she really had found a cockroach in her meal, why would she want a free voucher to come back again? I told my boss that I saw her put it in her meal, so he asked her to wait while he checked the camera. She went completely bonkers and spat out racial slurs, profanities, and awful threats at us. My boss remained calm and politely asked them to pay and then leave. They kept refusing to pay. It was only when my boss said he'd called the police that her husband reluctantly paid for the meal. The whole thing was ridiculous. Who would carry a dead cockroach around with them just to get free food? Yuck! My most memorable customer was a woman in her 30s. She was polite at first and told me that she would just order a drink for now, as the friend she was meeting was running late. I went and got her a glass of wine, and then I went to a nearby table to take their orders. I turned and looked over at her. She smiled at me. Then she picked up her wine and purposely poured it over her lap. 
She screamed out and jumped up to her feet. Both me and another waitress rushed over to her. She pointed over at me. It was her! She poured my wine all over me! I'm sorry, madam, but I wasn't even near you, I replied in the calmest tone I could manage. Are you calling me a liar? She screamed out. This is an outrage! My designer dress is ruined! Everyone in the restaurant was staring over at us. It was really embarrassing. Also, there was no way her dress was designer as my sister owned the same dress and it cost her $20. My boss came over and tried to calm the woman down. I passed her some napkins to dry herself with and my boss gave her a large wine on the house. He also said that he wouldn't charge her for the first one and her bill would be discounted 30% in total as an apology. Suddenly, the woman went from angry to polite. She thanked my boss, then she sat back down and looked at the menu. Ten minutes later, her friend showed up, and this woman ordered a three-course meal and acted as if nothing had happened. She even left me a tip. If I ever gain access to a time machine, the first thing I will do is go back, find the person who coined the customer is always right saying, and bring them back to watch this video. Then ask them if they want to correct their words. They certainly aren't always right. They just think that they are. My job can be challenging at times, but... I enjoy being a waitress. Luckily for me, the majority of my customers are lovely. I hope my funny stories made you laugh. They didn't feel funny at the time, but now when I look back at them, I smile. After all, if you don't laugh, you'll cry, and no one wants to do that. Holy baloney! Who is that? This guy was next level hot! And there's more. As I neared him, he didn't run off looking afraid. Seeing me dumbfoundedly gasping, Scarlet elbowed me. Wake up, chicka. We're late. She giggled as she dragged me to class. I saw it. Never thought I'd see the day that Margot the Troublemaker would go all gooey-eyed over some boy. (laughs) Scarlet teased me. I blushed and was completely tongue-tied eyes looking around awkwardly. It's a shame you're basically a walking, talking boy repellent. Yeah, right. I lowered my head to think, and when I looked up, Scarlet was texting, probably some cringe overload message to her boyfriend, Keith. I rested my chin on my hands and stared out of the window as I found myself daydreaming about that cute mystery guy. What time do you call this? Are you trying to get me kicked out of this place for covering for you again? Um, so's. I had something super important to do with Alfie. Important, huh? So I could end up in trouble for covering your butt? Because you want to pull some lame prank with that loser? Uh Uh-uh. How many times do I have to tell you? We only pranked him once, and that jerk totally deserved it. About that jerk? He's the captain of the basketball team, and Alfie's my friend. Okay, he might look a bit intimidating, but he's a nice guy. But that jock not only knocked Alfie out with his basketball, he also took his money out of his pocket when he was down. We weren't going to let him get away with this. So that night, we snuck out and poured greasy cooking oil all over the field, which made the whole team slip and fall again and again. It was hilarious. Unfortunately, word of our involvement reached the principal, So Scarlet had to call her dad to help me. Okay, so this wasn't exactly the first time Scarlet had saved me. She only got mad as she had to save Alfie's butt too, even though she hates him. (laughs) Come on, I'm sorry. Would you mind? It's midnight and we need to sleep. Shut up, Miley. No one asked you. Fine, go to bed and shut up so we can actually get some sleep. Oof. Those girly girls. Wake up, princess. The class is over. I groggily got up and followed Scarlet like a zombie to the cafeteria. But then I came to an abrupt halt. There, standing on the corner of the hallway, was that handsome guy. What on earth is going on? I've asked Keith to do some research. Now, do you want my help or not? I still froze and couldn't say anything. OMG. I'd never felt so nervous like this before. I nodded while holding her arm. (laughs) Wow. So all it took for the mighty Margot to turn into a timid wreck was some dude? Oh, and 
By the way, he's called Jared, and he's studying classical music. Very elegant. Huh? I blurted out. Classical music? This sucks! I mean, how's a girl like me ever gonna reach his level? Don't worry, I'll help you. Then she changed her attitude. On one condition. Hmm. <laughs> you know what? Scarlet demanded me to stop hanging out with Elfie, cause it was not good for the girly image I needed to get Jared's attention. Plus, I wouldn't be allowed to pass the dorm's curfew. If I broke these conditions, then she wouldn't help me anymore. Fine. I agree. Sorry, Elfie. You'll just have to carry on without me. Keith befriended Jared and asked him to come over to our school again to check on those pianos in the music room. When there's an oops emergency, he will leave Jared with me, who it turns out is struggling with the piano. Genius. As you can see, this plan is going well so far. Just this dress was really suffocating me. Ugh. But being around Jared seemed to suffocate me even more. Luckily, he was quite friendly, so we started talking easily, and now he's playing for me. Do you have any plans after school? No, not yet. I'm about to go to this music cafe in town. Would you like to join me? OMG! Of course I said yes! Does this count as a first date? We actually had a lot of fun. I was in seventh heaven. On our way back, I was startled when I saw Elfie across the street. Noticing me with Jared, Elfie glared at me with this maddened, wide-eyed look. I gave him the shush sign and looked away. No surprises. My phone beeped. You blew me off to hang out with that sissy boy? And what's with your clothes? Jeez, Elfie was angry for sure, but I couldn't do this right now. I'd promised Scarlet I wouldn't talk to him anymore. So I ignored the message and walked straight past him. As soon as I arrived back at the dorm, the girls cooed around and asked me about the date. They seemed so happy for me. So, when's the next date? He asked me to come over to his school tomorrow, and then we're going to have dinner. Ah! The girls screamed in unison. Surprising, as I didn't think these grumpy girls cared this much about me. I was so excited about the date. So I arrived early at Jared's school to find him practicing with another girl. I walked into the room with a smile on my face, and Jared introduced me to her. Maeve. Then he told me to wait there and left to go to the bathroom. This Maeve girl sniggered, then looked me up and down and said, Give it up. An unrefined girl like you doesn't deserve him. Huh? What on earth did I ever do to her? Angry, I knocked over her music sheets. She picked it up, then sternly said, Just you wait. I won't let you get away with it. Then she shoved past me and stormed off. Then, at dinner... I couldn't help it. So, that Maeve? Ah, our parents are very close, so we've been friends since we were little, and now we both study music. She seems really into you. I'm not so sure about that. We're just friends. So he doesn't like that Maeve girl? I guess. Just forget about her. I have a very important date with Jared, and I need your help. Right at that moment, a call from Alfie arrived. But Scarlet was sitting right next to me, so I couldn't pick up. After a few calls, he texted me. You gotta help me this time. I can't do it by myself. Oh, God help me. I didn't have the heart to abandon my friend. So, I decided to sneak out and go see Alfie. Okay, so it's not what you think. Those times I was late weren't because we were up to no good. We've been fixing up this abandoned house for these homeless kids instead. This time, one of those kids, Kevin, had a serious fever. I had to help Elfie borrow some money and take Kevin to the hospital. I tried to be deadly quiet as I crept into the dorm room, but I swear Scarlet is the lightest sleeper in existence. And sure enough, she was there waiting for me. Oh, hi, Margo. It's nice of you to join us. Yeah, sorry. It was, um, an emergency. You just can't help yourself, can you? You broke our agreement to go hang out with that thug friend of yours. I'm not helping you ever again. <sighs> this sucked. It looked like I was on my own. This is it. My big date with Jared. His dad's the conductor here. And from what I can gather, that's a massive deal. Without Scarlet to help me find the right dress for this event was a nightmare. Oh man, 
Everyone looked so luxurious and classy. I felt like a sore thumb. This obviously wasn't the world I belonged to. But Jared's gentle smile soothed me down a lot. But soon, Maeve was coming towards us. Ugh. Jared, darling, congrats! I think this concert will be amazing. Oh, it's you again. Nice dress. Ugh! She was really pulling on my leg. But stay calm. Now breathe. Breathe. Then they both talked about Mozart, Beethoven. I didn't understand a thing, as well as the whole concert. I didn't understand either. Afterward, Jared led me over to his parents. OMG, this was scary. I gave them the bouquet of flowers I've prepared and congratulated them on the concert. Luckily, they both seemed really friendly and were really content with my gift. But then Maeve appeared and hugged Jared's mom. Jared, it's lovely to be around such polite girls. Smirking, Maeve replied. I wouldn't be so sure about that. Margot here likes hiding her true personality. Okay, so I may have failed to keep my cool and blurted out some bad words. Oops. Jared and his parents looked shocked by this, but before I could try and rectify the situation, Maeve pulled out her phone and waved around a photo of me with Alfie. I wanted to explain, but I just ended up stuttering out a load of nonsense. In the end, Jared pulled me aside and told me, I think it's best if you just leave. I ran out of there close to tears. Worse still, I couldn't run in this dumb dress. I'd lost Jared, and it was past curfew. So if I went back now, Scarlet would get mad at me. So I decided that I wasn't going to go back. Nope. Instead, I was going to run away. I'd been staying here for a couple of days. I feel safe here, and Alfie bought me some clothes and food. Ugh. Why is she here? I wasn't in the mood for a lecture. But to my surprise, she rushed over to me and wrapped her arms around me. How could you just leave me like that? Have you any idea how worried I've been? Anyway, Alfie told me everything. I'm sorry for misjudging you. She pulled away. You do stink, though. <laughs> There's one more person who wants to see you, Margot. I looked at him with confusion. Then at the door, it was Jared. Margot, when I saw that photo, I was shocked. I thought I must be some joke to you, and you were really with Alfie. But then I couldn't stop thinking about you. Now I've spoken to Scarlet and Alfie. I know better. I like you, Margot. The real you. And I don't want you to think you have to change for me. Do you think you can give this idiot another chance? I hesitated, pretending that it was something I had to think about. Then smirking, I shouted out, yes, and rushed into his arms. So... What now? Well, I'm back in the dorm, and, yep, I still sneak out, and, yep, Scarlet still covers for me. <laughs> Jared and I are an official couple, and he's even helping me with a fundraiser concert to help out the homeless kids. So, I guess that this tough girl is actually not so tough after all. <laughs> Hi, my name's Eloise, and I'm a 19-year-old Franco-Algerian. The story I'm about to share with you started eight years ago when I was in middle school. The girl I was back then is nothing like the girl I am today, and that's where my story begins. I used to be ugly, like even uglier than Yoda from Star Wars. I had bad acne, I was super chubby, and I always bit my nails. Literally the only thing I had going for me was that I was smart. Okay, and I did have one friend, Anais. She was my only friend, and she complimented me all the time, even though I knew she was just saying sweet lies to me to make me feel better. And that did help. I was constantly being bullied, and I suffered all the time. But Anais was always there to pick me up and make me smile. I didn't understand why she wanted to be my friend. She was the total opposite of me. She had beautiful skin, a gorgeous smile, and those long legs that all the boys went wild over. Meanwhile, the only attention I got from boys was when they called me Spotted Whale or some other hurtful remark. When I turned 14, I decided that it was enough. 
The only way to stop them from bullying me was to change things. So I lost a few kilograms and started using an anti-acne cream. I thought that as a mixed race girl, I was destined to be pretty like all the other mixed race girls. But for some reason, I'd drawn the short straw and it sucked. Little by little though, my appearance started to improve and boys started to notice me. I mean, they were just the nerdy type, but it was a start. And then a few months later, I hit the jackpot. Andrew, one of the most handsome guys in the school's football team, asked me out. I couldn't believe my luck. However, there was just one small problem. I couldn't introduce him to Anais. She was so much prettier than me, and I felt sure that he'd dump me the second he set eyes on her. It was so hard to keep it a secret, and as I'm sure you can guess, she eventually found out. I mean, I was practically glued to my phone, sending Andrew heart emojis all the time. So it wasn't long before she caught a glimpse on my phone, and then I had no choice other than just tell her. Of course, she was super happy for me and couldn't wait to meet him. They both came over to my house and they got on so well. Andrew suggested we all watch a movie with popcorn, but at some point during the movie, I dozed off. I woke up 30 minutes later and I thought I was going to be sick. Andrew and Anais were cuddling up making out right in front of me. I knew it. I knew something like this would happen if they met. This was a disaster. But the craziest part was that they hadn't even noticed I'd woken up and continued to make out. But then Andrew glanced over and quickly jumped up, pushing Anais off him. Her top was unbuttoned and she quickly tried to cover herself. Then they both tried to explain, but I didn't want to hear it so I screamed at them to get out. They kept apologizing, but I just shoved them out the door. I was so upset and angry. Obviously, I didn't speak to Andrew or Anais again, and when we moved up to high school, my life was still not great, as they were both there, and so were the bullies that had bullied me all through middle school. All I wanted was to get to university and become my own person. Since then, many years have passed, and I've grown up in more ways than one. For starters, I passed my BAC, which is a French academic qualification, with the highest honors. Then I went on to university in the south of France. Finally, I was free, and I took that chance to sort myself out. I went to see a dermatologist about my skin, and two months later, I had the clearest skin ever, and I'd also started working out, so my body was looking pretty amazing too. I felt like a whole new person, all the boys at university were interested in me, and it felt like my hard work had paid off. I was now the mixed race beauty I'd always dreamt of becoming. But then one day during summer break, I received a letter about a school reunion with my old classmates from middle school. At first, I froze. No way could I go! But then I looked down at myself and realized this was my chance to show off who I'd become. We met up at a nightclub and I wore the most amazing red dress that could show off my beautiful curves and put on my leather jacket to complete my look. I left my hair down in loose waves and I kept my sunglasses on, even though it was nighttime, just because it made it look even more glamorous. When I walked in, everyone was already there. All the girls and guys who had bullied and humiliated me, and then of course, Andrew and Anais. They weren't a couple anymore, obviously, but you should have seen the look on their faces when they saw me. Everyone had changed and grown up, but no one had changed as much as me. I was clearly the prettiest girl in the room. People actually looked shocked. Like, they couldn't believe it was really me. We all started drinking and chatting, and at the end of the night, Andrew came over to me. He apologized and then had the nerve to ask me out again. I almost laughed in his face. Instead, I said to him, Eagles don't fly next to chickens. And then I turned around and walked out of there. I headed for my car, but suddenly I heard a voice calling my name. It was Anais. She told me she was happy to see me again. And she looked at me and asked if we could be friends again. I gave her the fakest smile ever and told her we had totally different lives now. Then I got in my car. As I drove off, I heard her shouting after me. She was saying that even though she agreed with all the boys that I'd become hot, she also agreed with the other girls that clearly I'd had plastic surgery to look like this, and that I was just a fake, trying to show off. 
I just laughed to myself. I didn't need to explain who I was to them anymore. I had my own life now, and they were just jealous. This is the story of how I broke the heart of a girl who really loved me. And I'm not proud of what I'm about to tell you, but here goes. It all started in freshman year of high school. I was living on Mayotte Island, which is a super beautiful French island. And unlike all the stylish guys at my school, I was pretty lame in comparison. Not only was I overweight, as in 95 kilograms, I was also one of the dumbest kids in class. Basically, I was a bit of a loser. And because of this, no one really wanted to be my friend. I was always eating lunch alone, and not one kid would sit at my table. This went on for a whole year, and by the time summer break came, I decided I couldn't take it anymore. Something had to change. So while everyone at school was vacationing and partying and enjoying the summer, I was working on something else. I set a goal for myself to lose weight before we went back to school, and I was really determined. I did a lot of research to figure out the best way, watching lots of YouTube videos and reading articles on Google about losing weight. And believe it or not, I stumbled across a really simple way. All I had to do was drink a lot of water and eat less, and I'd easily lose weight. At least that's what the article said. So I gave it a go. And I'm not going to lie, it was tough. Some days I'd have killed for a soda. And there were moments where I gave in to my cravings and binged on a liter of ice cream. But then I'd think about the fact I had no friends and how lonely life was. And my motivation would come back. By the end of summer break, I'd done it. I couldn't believe it. I'd lost 26 kilograms in total. So I was down to 69 kilograms and for a 1.85 meter tall guy, that is very slim. That first day back at school, all eyes were on me. Every single girl suddenly noticed me, and some of them even tried to speak to me. One girl asked if I was a new kid, and I almost laughed. Did I look that different? Even though girls were suddenly interested in me, I wasn't interested in them at all. That wasn't my goal. My goal was to get friends, and it happened very quickly. Pretty soon, I had a big group of friends, and because I felt more confident, my grades also started to get better. All of a sudden, I understood what socializing felt like, and I got invited to parties for the first time in my life. At one of these parties, me and my new group of friends were joking around and decided to make a bet to see who could get Najma, the prettiest girl in school, to go out with them. Najma is very petite, but she has such a beautiful body, and don't get me started on her face. Her eyes are this deep chestnut color, and her skin is so clear. Plus, she has these really cute cheeks that always blush pink when she smiles. Honestly, she's gorgeous, and every single guy in our school was crazy about her. But even after lots of attempts, none of them had managed to get her attention. Now that I was feeling good about myself and looking pretty decent, I decided to give it a go. I wanted to win her over. One day, I approached her at the bus stop. She was standing there on her own, and I just casually walked over to her and started making conversation. We got on the bus and we chatted the whole way until the bus reached her stop. Just before she got off, I asked for her number. And to my complete surprise, she actually gave it to me. Jackpot! On the one hand, I was super happy that my first attempt to ever flirt with a girl had ended so successfully. But on the other hand, I knew I was about to do the worst thing ever. Play with a girl's heart just to win a stupid bet. I really regret what I did back then, but I had no other choice. I was scared that if I failed at this one thing, my friends would ditch me, and I'd be a loser again. There was no turning back now, and no room for failure either. I would succeed at this, just like I'd succeeded at losing weight. I gave her a call and we chatted for like three hours. It was amazing. After that, we spoke every night on the phone and became really close. Two weeks later, we were an item. And it was official. I had a girlfriend. On our first date, we met at the mall. It was a nice place close to the beach, and after getting some pizza, we headed down there for a walk, and we kissed. My first kiss ever. I will never forget that moment for as long as I live. It's one of the best memories we shared together, and it'll be carved in my heart forever. That's how special it was. Everything was going well, but after a few months of being a couple, I slowly started to drift away from her. I don't know what got into me. 
I just started ignoring her calls, and even ignored her at school, too. She tried to sit with me at lunch, but I always said there was no space, but that I'd call her later. I was seriously being mean to her. Well, eventually, she started to think something was wrong, and at first, she suspected I was dating someone else behind her back. But later, the real truth came out. She found out that I was only dating her because of a bet. Some guy in my class called Lara told her. That was such a bummer, but I wasn't too surprised since Lara was my worst enemy. He's been constantly making my life a living hell, and guess he couldn't just let me catch a break. Of course, she broke up with me. A few days after she found out the truth, she called me to end things. As soon as we hung up, I felt so bad and realized that I really did have proper feelings for her. At first, it had just been about the bet and impressing my friends, but there was no denying that I legit liked this girl. I missed her so much, and it quickly became obvious that she was missing me too, because one night I received a message from her on Facebook that she must have sent to me by accident. It said, Oh, I just miss him so much. Even though he hurt me, I know he's a good guy. I don't think I'll ever be able to get over him. I caught a glimpse of it on the notification, but when I opened it, the text was removed. She must have meant to send it to her friend, which is a bit awkward. So I acted like I didn't see it, but now, at least I found out she still had feelings for me. By then, though, it was too late. I'd moved to mainland France for university, but I missed her so much. It's been 10 months since then, and I still have feelings for her. We got back in contact and chat three times a week, even though she's still on Mayotte Island and I'm in France. But she thinks it's better if we just stay friends now, as she's not ready to be in a relationship with me again. She's just graduated from high school, and I really don't know what to do. I just want to be with her again. But do you think I've ruined my chances forever? Hi there, I'm Betty and I'm 15 years old. Last year I developed a bit of an obsession for something that kind of took over my life. And, to put it bluntly, pretty much became my life. I neglected everything just to get my fix of this one thing. And if it hadn't been for my mom intervening, I don't know what my life would have been like today. In fact, I shudder even at the thought of it. It all started with a game. That sounds pretty tame, right? Well, hear me out. One day on the school bus, I overheard a group of girls in the year above me talking about this game, Gacha Life. I was so intrigued as it sounded exciting. So as soon as I got home later that day, I downloaded it. And well, let's just say the rest was history. From the moment I downloaded it, I couldn't stop playing it. It's fair to say that I'd always loved anime, and so that just made the game appeal even more. Being able to create my own characters and dress them up in cute outfits with wacky hairstyles, I just loved it. And then there was the fact I could create any scenario for them. I'd always been into storytelling and acting, and this was like a dream virtual world where I could let my imagination run wild and create whatever I wanted. Pretty soon, I was addicted. It's true, I couldn't stop playing it. Have you ever become addicted to a game? That thrill and anticipation of opening the app and waiting for the game to load? I couldn't get enough of it. I'd always been quite sociable, spending my weekends hanging out with friends and helping my mom in the garden, but now literally all I wanted to do was play gacha life. At first no one really noticed. But one night I got so carried away playing that the next moment I realized the sun was rising and I'd played right through the night. I hadn't slept a wink, and at breakfast I fell asleep on my plate of toast. That's when my mom started to worry, and then that day at school things got worse. I'd completely forgotten that we had a math test. I was so tired I could barely focus, so of course I ended up failing. And then I failed the next test. And the test after that, too. All I did was eat, sleep, go to school, and play gacha life. And then after a few weeks, if my mom hadn't called me down to dinner, I'd probably not have even eaten. I just couldn't think about anything else, except the world I'd created inside the game. At the time, I couldn't see it, but I had in fact started to mix up reality with the game. 
I started to dress like my favorite character I'd made in the game, even wearing the same pink blusher on my cheeks and wearing my hair in pigtails. I think I actually believed I was this character. I'm aware of how delusional that sounds now, but at the time it was totally normal to me. When my friends asked me why I was so busy at weekends now, I told them I had a boyfriend and that I was usually hanging out with him. The problem was, I didn't have a boyfriend. Not even remotely. It was my character in the game that had a boyfriend. But I'd mixed up my idea of reality and I seriously believed that the boy in the game was my boyfriend. My friends were dying to meet him and asked me so many questions about him. I wasn't even embarrassed about the fact that I was outright lying to them. Deep down, I obviously knew, but on the surface, I truly thought this imaginary boy was my real boyfriend. I was lying in bed playing the game one night when all of a sudden my mom came storming into my room and asked me to hand over my phone. When I wouldn't, she threatened to cut off my allowance and ground me if I didn't give it to her immediately. She said my friend's mom had called her, inquiring about my boyfriend and asking why I wasn't hanging out with my friends anymore. So now my mom wanted to see my phone to find out who this boyfriend was. She came over to my bed and grabbed it out of my hand. And then she saw what was on the screen. My imaginary characters kissing. And then she looked at me. My bloodshot eyes and unkempt hair. And she told me that if I didn't sort myself out, she'd take me to see a psychologist. Because clearly, according to her, I had a problem. I stayed up so late playing that night that I overslept the next morning. And that's when my mom called it quits. She took me straight to a psychologist that afternoon, even though I protested the whole way there. The psychologist asked me why I seemed so attached to my phone. Then I told him everything. That it wasn't my phone I was attached to. It was this game, Gacha Life. I had been so reluctant to see a psychologist, but actually he really helped me. He made me realize that it's okay to play games like Gacha Life. In fact, it can be very beneficial for my imagination and creativity, but there also needs to be a healthy boundary established between how I view the game. It's not real life. It's just a game, and I have to find a balance between my school life and what I do in my spare time. No game is worth jeopardizing my future, and after that first session with the psychologist, I realized I need to live my life in the real world and not escape into the game all the time. I do still play Gacha Life sometimes, because it is fun, but it's now a healthy hobby, as opposed to an addictive one. I'm so grateful my mom helped me when she did, otherwise who knows what level of obsession I might have taken it to. Have you ever played Gacha Life, or become addicted to a game? Please share your experiences with us in the comments section below, and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more stories. Hi guys, I'm Chelsea, and I want to tell you my story about a popular girl and a loser boy. I suppose I've always been popular. I mean, I've never been a leader, but I always managed to fit right into the cool group at school. My friend, Chrissy, was the prettiest and most popular girl in school. All the boys drooled over her, and all the girls wanted to be her. Chrissy could be nasty at times, and she liked to tease the uncool kids. She put gone off yogurt in this loser boy called Henry's backpack, then laughed and told him he stank when he ended up covered in the stuff. As mean as she could be, I had no problem with her. Yeah, she could be mean, but she also cheered me up after Brian Wilson ditched me on social media. Then she made up a pretty mean meme about him. I liked being friends with Chrissy, and I liked being popular. Then everything changed at Chrissy's party. Most people had left, and it was just our group of five kids remaining there, including Zach, the boy I had a massive crush on. We were all a little bit tipsy, so when Chrissy announced with a smirk that it was truth or dare time, we all agreed. Ashley picked truth and had to answer a super embarrassing question about her sex life. There was no way I was answering a question like that, so when it was my turn, I picked dare. Chrissy knew I liked Zach, so I was expecting for her to dare me to kiss him, only she didn't. Chelsea, you have exactly one week to ask that loser boy Henry out, or you'll have to do a super dare. 
And trust me, it'll be bad. I stared at her open-mouthed. She had to be kidding. Henry was a massive loser. If you complete your dare, then we can publicly humiliate him. Imagine how funny that'll be. She grinned. All of my friends were looking at me, so I tried to shrug the dare off like it was no big deal. Sure, easy, I replied. I had no idea how I was meant to flirt with Henry. I hadn't spoken to him before. I'd been dared on the Saturday, and I wouldn't see Henry until school on Monday. So, seeing as my time was ticking, I tried to send him a friend request. Only, I couldn't find him online anywhere. Jeez, this boy was weird. Who didn't have an online account? On Monday, I accidentally bumped into him by his locker and dropped my books. I apologized to him and gave him my sweetest smile. He blushed, then bent down and helped me pick them up. The next day, I managed to start up a conversation with him as we were leaving English class. He seemed keen to talk to me, but then his loser friend Martine came and dragged him away, mumbling something about not liking the company I keep. Martine was big into colored hair and overdone black eyeliner, so she was high on Chrissy's torment list. I realized that if I wanted to complete this dumb dare, then I'd have to make the losers think I was one of them. I spoke to my friends and set up my plan. In lunch, when I walked over to our table, Ashley stood up, her arms folded. You're not welcome here, she shouted at me. Yeah, you suck, Chelsea, and your hair has the worst split ends I've ever seen. Chrissy winked at me. I faked my best upset look and walked off. When I reached Henry's table, I burst into tears and placed my tray down next to him. I placed my head in my hands and let out more fake tears. Needless to say, my plan worked, and for the rest of the week, my real friends played along and ignored me while I got to know Henry. At first, I hated having to flirt with Henry. He was so quiet and awkward, and he wore the same light gray t-shirt for three days in a row. Ew! But then, something weird happened. When I was stuck on my math homework, Henry explained it to me. He bought me a chalk chip muffin at break time to cheer me up, and when I wore my fave floral dress, which Chrissy had previously snorted at, he said I looked pretty. I found myself warming to Henry and opening up to him. I ended up telling him all about my dad's affair with the neighbor and how my home life was a nightmare. Friday arrived and I was on edge. I couldn't fail the dare, not after all the hard work I'd put in this week. I was on my way out of school feeling disheartened and dreading my upcoming super dare when someone called my name. I spun around to see Henry rushing after me. Then, he nervously asked me out. I was so relieved, I almost screamed yes. We arranged to meet in a local restaurant. He looked so happy, and I did feel a little bad. I showed up on our date in my prettiest dress. Henry was in a shirt, which I'm sure he'd bought especially for this occasion. He actually looked kind of cute. Before we entered the restaurant, Chrissy and the rest of my friends jumped out from behind the corner and started laughing and pointing at him. Zach was filming the whole thing on his phone. Henry seemed confused and looked at me for clarification. I forced myself to smile and started laughing and pointing at him, too. He stormed off, looking upset and embarrassed. The video ended up all over social media, and it was soon the talk of the school. After that, Henry wouldn't even look at me. I tried apologizing to him, but he just slammed his locker shut and walked off. He hated me, and I couldn't say I blamed him. The problem was, the more I thought about Henry the more I realized that he wasn't a loser at all. He was quiet and different, but he was also smart, funny, and cute, and I liked him. I thought he had the same feelings about me too, but I'd messed up first. I'd publicly humiliated him. Now I don't know what to do. Should I try apologizing to Henry again and properly explain why I did what I did? Or should we both carry on ignoring each other? Hey, kid. Why are you here alone? What's your name? I first noticed this little girl when I discovered this epic pastry shop near my school. She'd always be sitting in the alleyway nearby, wearing the same clothes over and over again.
clutching a teddy bear in her arms. She looked up at me with her big, innocent eyes and answered timidly, I... I'm Alex. Then she started crying quietly and said, My mom and dad are always working, so I wait for them here. Sometimes they're gone for days. Oh, this poor little girl. She must have been starving as she kept eyeing my bag of croissants. I gave her one, and she said chocolate croissants were her favorite. Wow, just like me. No wonder I'd felt drawn to this little girl. She ate it so fast, and I told her I'd go buy her another one, and I'd be right back. I couldn't bear to see her so hungry. How could her parents just leave her like that? I ran as fast as I could, but when I got back to the alleyway, she was gone. How weird. I couldn't see her anywhere. I walked home, and that night, I couldn't stop thinking about her. Had her parents come to pick her up? The next day, I went back to the pastry shop, and before I even got there, I heard some kids shouting. I tried to take a closer look, and there Alex was, huddled on the ground while the kids threw her teddy bear around. Oh no, she was crying. This made me so angry, so I charged towards them. Hey! Leave her alone right now, or you'll have me to deal with. The bullies immediately ran off. I rushed over and put my arm around Alex. She wiped tears from her eyes and said, Thank you. Other than my teddy, you're the only one who wants to be my friend. I swear the lump in my throat couldn't get any bigger. Then I asked her what happened. She told me how she skipped school because she was bullied for wearing old, smelly clothes. Even the teachers were mean to her, she said. Oh gosh, my heart. I couldn't bear this, so I held out my hand. Alex, I can't leave you out here like this. I've always wanted a little sister. So what do you say? I promise I'll protect you. Alex squeezed my hand, which I took as a yes, and then we got up and she asked if she could show me something. It was a playground that she used to go to, and as soon as I saw it, I felt something well up inside me. It looked so familiar. We played on the jungle gym and the swings, and they even had a big slide that was so fun to play on. We played for hours, and it felt like I'd gone back in time to my childhood. Well, if only I could. Actually, remember my childhood. As far as I know, when I was just eight years old, I had a big accident. It gave me a major head injury and wiped my memory completely. Ever since then, I've been going to therapy and taking medication. But it's so weird not being able to remember anything from before. I try to focus on the present, though, and I know I'm lucky to even be alive. However, sometimes the migraines from the accident get really bad, and that's exactly what happened when we were on the swings. One minute, I was looking at the clouds and laughing. The next, I felt myself slipping off the swing and landing on the ground. The last thing I saw was Alex running towards me. When I opened my eyes, I was in a hospital bed, and my parents were there holding my hands. Recently, my migraines had been getting more frequent, and it really worried my mom and dad. My first thought was, where's Alex? I asked my parents if they'd seen an eight-year-old girl, but they looked confused. I realized she'd probably been scared and run off. She was constantly on my mind, though, so as soon as I got out of the hospital a few days later, I went to find her again. She was nowhere to be seen, but there was a fire in my heart that kept urging me to find her, so I couldn't give up. I had to find her. I ran to the playground and was relieved to see her on the swings. She looked so sad, so I asked her what was up, and she burst into tears and she said, My family, they lost everything. A gang came to our house and stole everything we own. Even I started crying after hearing that. How could people be so cruel? She then told me she hadn't eaten for days, as her parents now had no money to buy her food. Luckily, I had just bought some chocolate croissants, and she gobbled them both. Meanwhile, my mind was cluttered with thoughts of helping Alex. My savings were barely enough to support her, but maybe my parents could help? They donated to a church in town, so I'm sure they'd be happy to help Alex. I quickly called my mom 
and she said she'd love to meet Alex and see what they could do. So I happily told Alex the good news, and we walked straight to my house. I gave her some more food, and we sat on the couch to wait for my parents. Seeing her bright face made me feel so happy. As soon as I heard their car pull up, I ran to the door and said, Mom, Dad, Alex is here. My parents came in and looked around the room. Then my dad said, Um, sweetie, where is she? I pointed to the sofa and said, She was just there. Then I called her name, but she didn't reply. I didn't get it. Where was she? My mom looked worried and said, Is she too shy? Are you sure she was with you, honey? I frantically checked the whole house, but she was nowhere to be found. I was starting to panic now, but my dad held me and said, Alice, sweetie, calm down. Maybe you just need a rest. Then I heard my mom whispering to him, The severe migraines probably have drained her out again. Get her upstairs. I'll call the doctor to ask about hallucinations. I'm not hallucinating! She's real! Why don't you believe me? I screamed out while trying to break away from my dad's arms. I was feeling dizzy by this point. My head was pounding, and the next moment, everything went dark again. I ended up in hospital again, for the second time that week. Wow, that was a new record. I was lying there pretending to still be unconscious to eavesdrop on my parents chatting to the doctor. Alice has been acting a little strange. She keeps mentioning a homeless girl, and it sounds quite similar to her childhood. Today, she even said she brought her home to meet us, but we can't find her anywhere. And I don't think she even exists, my mom said. The doctor then said, It's possible that this little girl is actually Alice's lost memories. Sometimes after therapy and medication, old memories can start resurfacing. Maybe this little girl was someone from Alice's childhood. A friend or something. What? This was crazy. Was Alex from my childhood? I didn't understand. I sat bolt upright and stuttered, Are, are you hiding something from me? I could tell right away they were, because my parents looked panicked, and my mom said, Listen, sweetie, it's been a long day for you. Now isn't the right time for this story. But I'll tell you tomorrow, okay? The next day, my parents drove me to the church that they donate to every year. I was so confused and kept asking them who Alex was. Eventually, a nun appeared, and we all sat down in a little room on the third floor. Then the secrets came pouring out. My parents weren't my real parents. After I had the accident, my parents adopted me from the church. They'd picked me up at the hospital right after I recovered and didn't tell me what happened because they didn't want to make my life any harder. They just wanted me to be happy. I couldn't believe it. Then the nun asked me to explain what had been happening recently, and I told her about Alex. As soon as I said her name, the nun looked shocked and quickly pulled out a photo album. She showed me a photo of two twin girls and said, This is you, Alice, holding the teddy bear. And next to you is your twin sister. Her name is Alex. Suddenly, the room was spinning. This was all too much. I had a twin sister? Before I even had time to ask anything, the nun took my hand and led me over to a big window near the stairs. Through her words, all the past memories came rushing back to me. My biological parents had brought me and Alex to the church because they couldn't afford to raise us. No families wanted to adopt both of us, so the nun told us we would be separated. This was the most painful news we'd ever heard. So that night, we decided to escape together. I gave Alex my teddy bear to hold so that I could climb out the window first. But unfortunately, I slipped and fell from such a height that I'm lucky I even survived. That's what wiped all my memories. I stared at the window as the nun told me all of this. This was insane! How many secrets had been hidden from me all this time? So, where is Alex now? I asked, tears rolling down my cheeks. Turns out, Alex had been adopted by another family. 
but the nuns had lost contact with her because the family had moved overseas. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I had to see my sister. But how could I find her without any information? I started to search social media like crazy, but nothing came up. I wouldn't give up hope, though. I updated my journey finding Alex every day on a personal blog. Not one night I went to sleep without thinking about her and wondering how she was doing. Fortunately, people on the internet actually showed a lot of interest and support for my story. It got passed around, but so far, there still wasn't any hint about Alex. Even the illusion of baby Alex wouldn't show up anymore, ever since the day I heard the truth. But I knew in my bones that we would find our way back to each other again somehow. And then, one morning, I woke up from a strange dream with another migraine, so I decided to take a walk and get some fresh air and drop by the pastry shop for breakfast. I glanced over to the alley as usual, and I saw myself pacing around with a teddy bear in hand, looking kind of lost. Sounds like I'd lost the plot, right? Well, I hadn't, because it actually was Alex. We were frozen for like a whole minute when our eyes met. Then, without a single word being said, we just ran into each other's arms in tears. So, long story short, Alex had moved to France since 10, and ever since then, she'd also been trying to find me. Thanks to a post on Twitter, she realized I was still here, and so she applied for a scholarship to America so she could find me. And, well, there she was, standing right in front of me. Words can't express how unreal it still was to look at her every time. Oh, don't worry. Everyone, including my parents, have confirmed she's an actual person. Not another product of my imagination. <laughs> Thank God. I can't believe the crazy roller coaster ride that my life has been on for the past months. From that moment on, we were inseparable. And now, we're planning on moving in together. The only thing left for us to do is to find our biological parents. Alex remembers them clearly, so she's been filling me in on the first eight years of our life together. Wish us luck! In every high school boy's story, there's always a drop-dead gorgeous girl who makes him do stupid things to try to win the girl over, right? Well, my story is pretty much along those lines, except I was competing with a dog. Yeah, you heard me. Here we go. So my name's Liam, and I'm 17. And Suzanne is the girl I was chasing. I remember the first time I laid eyes on her. It was during a football match at school, and she was one of the cheerleaders. Her bouncy blonde locks and her bright blue eyes drove me crazy and I couldn't take my eyes off her. In other words, I was smitten, so that's when I started my pickup plan. I paid my friend $10 to find out her address and her favorite food. Stalk her much? <laughs> well, this was only the beginning. Once I had her address, I walked up to her house holding a strawberry cheesecake with a love letter attached to it. I peeked over the fence and was about to put the cake on the doorstep, ring the doorbell, and run away. But as I was walking towards the door, a dog appeared and jumped towards me. I freaked out and tried to run away, but instead I face-planted in the ground and, of course, the cake landed right next to me and the letter flew away. What a disaster. Plus, the damn dog kept biting at my pants. Meanwhile, I was screaming like a little kid. And guess who appeared at that moment? None other than Suzanne. Noticing the cake and the letter with her name on it, she smiled down at me, helped me up and said she had a first aid kit inside. She said her dog, Loki, just got excited when he saw new people. And then she kept apologizing, but I told her it was okay. And to be honest, I'd fall down like that every day if it meant I got to be helped up by Suzanne. After that, we started texting, although most of the time she was sending me photos of Loki. Finally, after a few months of texts, I plucked up the courage to ask her out on a proper date, and it was amazing. After dropping her off at her front door, I decided that that was the moment to confess my feelings and ask her to be my girlfriend. I was shaking so much that I almost forgot to breathe. But luckily, she told me she liked me too. Then suddenly, she grabbed me and planted a big kiss on my cheek. And so I held her and decided to go in for a proper kiss on the lips. But out of nowhere, Loki appeared and leapt on me and I fell flat on my face. Not again! And this time, I was furious. I sat up and I was about to go crazy. But then I noticed Suzanne was laughing. 
Loki seems to like you, she joked. He's driving me insane, but seeing how happy she was made my anger all gone. I was about to stand up and go in for a kiss again, but Loki kept pulling Suzanne inside. She had no choice but to follow him, so I was left there all alone. Man, what was that dog's problem? After that night, I refused to go to Suzanne's house when we met up. I even told her I thought her dog hated me, and she thought that that was hilarious. She then said he was just protective, and then she shared the story of why they adopted him. So when I was eight, my best friend lived next door. His name was Andrew, and Loki was his pet. The three of us were so close, but one day Andrew's parents got divorced, and Andrew moved to Canada with his dad. So he left Loki with me. It's been nine years since we saw each other. A thought crossed my mind. Maybe Loki hated me because he thought Suzanne was Andrew's girlfriend. No way. He was just a dog, right? And the trouble was never ending. Prom night arrived, and Suzanne was so excited. I made sure I got to her house early and waited her for a while while she did her hair and stuff. I told her I'd wait outside, but she insisted I come in. I was dreading seeing Loki, but of course there he was, waiting for me by the couch with a smirk on his face. I mean, come on, since when did dogs smirk? I sat there nervously watching him, but after Suzanne had gone back upstairs, he came over to me with a photo in his mouth. It was Suzanne sitting next to a boy, and Loki was there too. Obviously, it was Andrew in the photo, and they looked so happy together. Why was Loki showing me this? I looked Loki straight in the eyes and said, Listen up, Loki. Andrew and Suzanne aren't together. Suzanne is my girlfriend, so just leave us alone, okay? Loki just kept staring at me, then he left. It was clear I'd lost the plot. There I was threatening a dog. <laughs> After a while, Suzanne came downstairs, and we were about to leave. But I couldn't find my shoes anywhere. After 30 minutes of looking, we still couldn't find them, and by then Suzanne was pretty upset with me. She ran upstairs and locked herself in her room. I didn't know what to do, so I got up to leave barefoot. When I got outside, I noticed Loki smirking again, but I wasn't in the mood to care about him now. Suddenly I heard footsteps behind me. I turned around and it was Loki with my shoes in his mouth. He dropped them at my feet and then ran off. I couldn't believe it. That stupid dog stole my shoes and ruined our night. I spent the next week texting Suzanne trying to apologize, and eventually she forgave me. But I still hate Loki so much. He was seriously making my life a living nightmare. During the summer, Suzanne was going to Chicago with her parents to visit her aunt, so she asked me to look after Loki for two weeks. What? You've got to be kidding me. I had no choice but to agree. If I said no, I'd risk losing Suzanne. So when I went to pick him up, I saw him standing there smirking at me again. It looked like he was saying, Oh, hey, Liam, are you ready for two weeks of hell with me? The worst part was all the instructions Suzanne had for me about how to take care of her precious Loki. Feed him with organic dog food three times a day in his special bowl. Then make sure he gets two walks a day, no less than five miles each time. And every night at 6 p.m. he needs his bath with his doggy bubble bath. He likes to be massaged behind the ears. And please read him a bedtime story to ensure he has sweet dreams. Uh, this had to be some kind of joke. How would I remember all of that? And as expected from day one, it was a total disaster. It was summer vacation. So I wasn't going to bed early. In fact, I was playing video games with my friends all night. So I never managed to wake up at 6 a.m. to feed them. And surely he wouldn't die if he skipped a meal, right? But well, he didn't give me much choice. He leapt onto my bed at 6.30 a.m. licking my face and demanding food. Another time I was going to my friend's house, so obviously I couldn't take him with me. So before leaving, I said, hey, Loki, be a good boy. I'll be back soon. Then I smirked and locked the door. Loki started barking, so I knew he was angry. Well, it served him right. However, when I got home that night, I discovered he peed all over my clothes and messed up my entire room. He'd clearly done this to get revenge, and I was fuming. I started yelling at him as I was cleaning up the mess. And that's when I realized that I'd have to take him everywhere with me. Even though he was super annoying, I started to understand why Suzanne loved him. He was smart, affectionate, and I guess it's kind of nice to have company. When I was watching movies alone, he would come over and lay in my lap. When I played video games, I could ask him to bring me snacks. And once I went to the toilet and realized the loo roll was finished, and I shouted, Loki, can you please get me some loo roll? And he actually brought me one. A few days later, we were out walking in the park, and I saw some boys playing basketball. I was desperate to join them, so I told Loki to wait for me. But after the match, he was nowhere to be seen. I freaked out and frantically searched the whole park, but it was hopeless. Suzanne would never forgive me if I lost her precious Loki. So the next day, I put up some flyers hoping someone had found him. 
Well, luckily for me, someone called me and said they had found him. I immediately went to get him and waited outside the address they'd given me, which was in a kind of dodgy part of town. While I was waiting, two men dressed in black clothes approached me. They looked suspicious, so I tried to step out of the way, but one of them grabbed my arm and said, Give us your money, otherwise you might get hurt. I started struggling and trying to get away, but this made them even angrier. I freaked out when suddenly I heard a familiar barking. Loki! He was rushing towards us and started biting at the robber's clothes, pulling them away from me. I was so relieved and after a while, the robbers ran off, scared half to death. I gave Loki the biggest hug and he was wagging his tail in delight. Then a woman with a dog came towards us. Turns out she was the person who had called me. She'd been walking her dog Penny in the park when Loki had started following them and wouldn't leave Penny alone. He'd been smitten with her, so Penny's owner didn't know what to do and took Loki home. Eventually, she saw the posters and that's when she'd contacted me. Ha! Huh, so Loki was as bad as me, chasing a pretty girl. How funny. When we got home, I thanked Loki again for saving me. Then I said, You know Andrew doesn't live here anymore, right? He's in Canada, which is far away. But listen, I love Suzanne so much and I know you do too. So we'll take care of her together, okay? He kept staring at me like he was waiting for something more. So then I said, Oh, right. Yeah. If you agree, I promise I'll take you to Penny's house to visit her. Deal? I reached out my hand to shake his, and he legit put his paw in my hand. Okay, done deal. A few days later, Suzanne got back and picked up Loki. And when I told Suzanne everything that had happened, she burst out laughing. After that, our relationship got even better, and we started hanging out with Loki more. Although whenever I wanted to kiss her, I always said to Loki, Hey bro, look away. And he never once tried to interfere again. Loki and I are on good terms now, as he's in love with Penny as I am with Suzanne. It's true what they say, boys go wild for pretty girls. The bell had already rung, but here I was, still stuck in chemistry class. Mr. Evans won't stop droning on about the big test coming up. Abigail, Abigail, you do know what a bond is, right? That's easy. My dad goes on about them all the time. U.S. treasuries, Japan bonds. They are financial bonds. We're talking about chemical bonds for Christ's sake. Close enough. Don't you think I deserve a grade increase? Enough. Go and meet your homeroom now. This is unacceptable. Jeez, his bad mood must have been contagious for adults, as Miss Garcia was also in a foul mood. So, Abigail, I will organize a meeting with your dad. My dad? No, no, he'll go mad and take away my credit card. This seriously cannot go on anymore. Your grades are on a downward spiral. I promise, I'll actually study this time. Please, let me prove it by acing my next test. Your next test? Let's see. That appears to be your chemistry final in two weeks' time. That's perfect! I need time to process all the knowledge I've been learning anyway. And, phew, crisis averted. Now, where is Norma? I need some retail therapy with my bestie. Hmm, so I have two weeks to work this out. I mean, you can probably cram in quite a bit within that time. No, Norma! I have to figure out what I need to buy before my dad locks the card! Right then, a nearby waiter suddenly tripped and spilled orange juice onto... Norma and her newly brought Chanel bag! Oh no! But to my surprise, she just smiled and dismissed the waiter. What was that, Norma? What's got into you? Love, I guess? It's still early days, but I'm in love, Abby. <sighs> Isn't the world so dreamy and beautiful? Hmm, you are kinda happy? Hold up, Mrs. Garcia is single. If I found someone special, then she'd be too distracted to call in my dad for the meeting. Yeah, I guess. Or, you know, you could actually study. Don't be ridiculous. Mr. Evans is single too. Two bird, one stone. <laughs> so the next morning, I joined Mr. Evans' chemistry club to spy on him. Wanna hear a joke? What do you think zero says to eight? Nice bell. <laughs> hey girl, can I be the photon to your electron and take you to an excited state? Please, somebody save me already. Yo, Callum, you're late to the party. We're having a blast over here. Are you coming home with me or Mrs. Garcia today? Miss Garcia? Hi, Hank. My mom's staying late at school today, so... This Callum guy is Miss Garcia's son? I sure came to the right place. Mr. Evanson gave some boring lecture about states of matter. After drawing a whole maze of weird symbols and stuff on the board, he asked if anyone had any questions. Here comes my chance. Oh, good. Curiosity is the gateway to knowledge. Go ahead, Abigail. I was wondering, 
if you like tea or coffee. Oh, and also, are you more of a dog or cat person? Can you please pay attention to the lesson? Callum, as a top student, I think you can help her. Of course you will, Mr. Evans. Poor guy, he's totally oblivious that he's been chosen for my master plan. Who made him Miss Garcia's son in the first place? So, Callum, right? You know, your mom's actually my homeroom teacher. Yeah, I got that figured out long ago. Wait, what? You already knew about me? How can I not? The lowest scoring student in every class? You're my mom's favorite dinner topic. That's why I'm here, studying to change your mom's dinner topic. Could you help me with that? Nope. I don't know what you're up to, but keep me out of it. No way I was letting this plan fail. So I decided to follow Callum to the library after school to learn more about Miss Garcia. Oops, what a coincidence. Didn't expect you to be here. Thought you'd be studying with your mom 24 seven. We're just normal people who do other things apart from studying. You know, reading, watching movies, talking. I guess you and your mom only read specialized books. <laughs> Quite the opposite, actually. We both enjoy Victor Hugo. What about you? Since when were you suddenly interested in chemistry? M me? Why, why not? I've always had the biggest passion for chemistry. The way all the substances interact with each other is mind-blowing. Chemical bonds, you know? If you're that interested, then yeah, I'll make you a master of chemistry. But first, you may want to try reading your book the correct way. Did he just say he'd help me with chemistry? Hmm, why does my gut instinct tell me trouble is on the way? I came home with Callan's precious piece of information about his mom and forged the cheesiest love letter, well, on behalf of Mr. Evans, of course, and made sure to hand deliver it. Who knew someone as strict as Miss Garcia had a soft spot for Victor Hugo romance novels? <laughs> From my hiding spot, I saw Callum open the door and get the letter. Okay, first break down. The next morning, I was excited to peek into the teacher's room to check on Miss Garcia. But why is the principal here? And in his hand is... The love letter! Ye who suffer because ye love, love yet more. To die of love is to live in it. From David. David Evans? <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Brois. That's actually my, uh, literature assignment. Wrong address. <laughs> How in the caramel fudge did this letter end up here? Callum obviously got the letter. I decided to sneak the letter directly into Miss Garcia's bag afterward. Better safe than sorry. In the following days, I needed to send Mr. Evans the other love letter too. Only, Callum was a little too determined to turn me into a chemistry master. He made sure I got the notes imprinted in my brain, questioned me on the topics like an FBI agent interrogating a hard case, and even had his eyes fixed on me every time I carried out the experiments. I got no time left for my plan. You know what I've come to find out? You're actually not that bad at studying, just need some more attention. As if I care! When will he leave me alone so I can take the other bird down? Right then, Mr. Evans suddenly called Callum to the discussion room next door. Gotta go. You can finish the oxidation. Remember to measure carefully and not take your eyes off of it for a second. Don't sweat it. I've got this. As soon as he left, I sneaked into Mr. Evans' room and put the letter in his bag. But when I was about to leave, something caught my eye. A picture of young Mr. Evans. Yikes, did too much studying and no loving make his hair leave him for good? Hmm, he has a lot of books in here. Some of them are by... Victor Hugo! Ha! Huh. Seems Mr. Evan and Miss Garcia are made for each other. Oh, sugar, the experiment! I ran back to the lab and poured all the substances in, but it was weird. What did I tell you? All the time spent on this experiment, just to see a burn. Oh, wait, what is this purplish substance? Mauve! We've accidentally created Mauve instead! You're so brilliant, Abby! Didn't really know what was going on, but are those my cheeks I can feel blushing? What's gotten into me? Didn't know you two are progressing that fast. Maybe keep it down a notch in public. Seeing Hank made us both turn cherry red and jolt apart. It was just a joke, but somehow my heart was flipping. After the incident, Callum didn't seem so annoyed with me anymore. Instead, he was kind of caring. He would patiently explain things I didn't understand and clean up after our experiments. Talk about having great chemistry together. Literally. The two-week mark soon arrived, but strangely, all the questions were not hard at all. I know all of the answers. They're all on topics I covered with Callum. Later that day, I was walking when Callum zoomed over to me. Mr. Evans said you passed the test. I knew you could do it. Abby, if you'd like, do you want to go out for a movie? Abby, Abby, shocking news. I just saw Mr. Evans and Miss Garcia holding hands in the school garden. Things are progressing. 
Norma and I both turned into excited dolphins when Callum's happy expression fell. What are you talking about? My mom with whom? Mr. Evans, you should thank Abby. It was her plan to get your mom a new boyfriend. The plan? Is that what you call it? Passion for chemistry? So what? It worked, didn't it? This isn't gonna happen. No way. What's your problem? Why don't you want your mom to be happy? Talk about selfish. Callum couldn't answer and huffed off. He's been ignoring me ever since. And me? I decided to find a new lab partner. Well, if Hank would quit getting in the way, why did he always poke his nose in? I gave Hank a dirty look, but he just pushed Callum toward me. You two are welcome. Ugh, what gives? Callum couldn't even meet my eye. I felt kind of bad for Callum. I guess no one wants to see their parent dating their chemistry teacher, right? Why bother anyway? I should be happy because the plan has worked out. What's up with Callum? Why is he acting as if someone burglarized his house or something? Actually, Callum's dad walked out on them a couple of years back. Since then, he swore to never let anyone hurt his mom again. That's why he's so against your matchmaking plan. That explains a lot, but wait, how did you know about the matchmaking plan? Hank started to sweat bullets while Norma constantly winked at him. Hey, are you guys hiding something from me? Don't tell me. No, no, we're not dating. We, we're... You said it yourself, idiot. Hmm, that makes sense. The next morning, Miss Garcia suddenly got sick, and this Miss Flowers came in to cover. Different from our strict homeroom, Miss Flowers didn't teach much and seems pretty chill with whatever we do in class. Great, huh? Yeah, it would be if she didn't keep on flirting with Mr. Evans. Mr. Evans didn't look comfortable with Miss Flowers at all. She was obviously trying so hard to win him over. Poor Miss Garcia. She looked so happy with Mr. Evans before. My master plan can't have been for nothing. I gotta do something. So I handcrafted a reminder love letter on behalf of Miss Garcia again. That was sure to make Mr. Evans' heart give off butterfly flutters. But I was sneaking it onto his desk when Miss Flowers appeared. Abigail? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Mr. Evans is my dream man, not hers. No, he's not. He and Miss Garcia are obviously made for each other. Duh. I demand that you take that back at once. He's my heart's desire, mine. No, he's not. He goes all gooey-eyed at Miss Garcia, not you. This is unacceptable. Detention. That's not fair, Miss Flowers. You can't punish her over nothing. You. Garcia's son, right? Wanna play Hero Saves Beauty? Detention for both of you, now! Miss Flowers? More like Miss Tyrant. What kind of a teacher made students clean the windows for detention? Ugh, these stupid windows, breaking my back already. And Callum being all frosty the snowman with me is not helping. You brought all of this on yourself. What? If you hadn't have given the love letter to the principal in the first place, Mr. Evans and your mom would be official already. My mom and I are fine by ourselves. Who's being stubborn now? Hank already told me everything. I understand you're upset, but have you ever thought about what your mom wants? She sure looked happy with Mr. Evans. Callum didn't say anything, but I could tell from his glazed eyes that he was thinking hard about this. When Callum and I finally got out of detention, Hank and Norma rushed in. We just heard that Miss Garcia has food poisoning. She's fine now, but Miss Flowers will probably cover for another week. Why do I feel like Miss Flowers has something to do with this? She visited my mom yesterday and gave her a casserole. That's it! Miss Flowers must have poisoned Miss Garcia so she could replace her. But this is getting crazy. Hmm, what can we do? How about we publicize all the love letters online so the whole school knows about Miss Garcia and Mr. Evans? I mean, if that's okay with you? Callum didn't say anything and just nodded. We immediately rushed to the IT room, but the computer's locked. Let me handle it. I know the password. With Callum's help, we posted on the school forum. And guess what? Everyone's smitten with Miss Garcia and Mr. Evans' love story. Cute, huh? We then left to visit Miss Garcia, but Miss Flowers appeared in front of us. What do you all think you're doing? Making a fuss on the school forum? I bravely stepped up to face her. You've seen it. Mr. Evans and Miss Garcia belong together. You should just give up on him already. Is that so? You know what? Mr. Evans actually wanted me to meet him for a private talk tonight. And as for your homeroom teacher, guess what? That position will be mine full time. <laughs> I'm afraid you've got it all mixed up, Miss Flowers. It's Mr. Evans, followed by Miss Garcia. We ask you to come to talk about Miss Garcia's food poisoning. That's right. Earlier today, you visited me, asking me if I was ready to come back to class tomorrow. You were very kind and even brought me homemade food. Little did I know that this was a deliberate attempt for you to make me sick. Luckily, Mr. Evans dropped by just in time to get me to the ER. And now you're talking about taking my place? 
No way! But, but the students clearly love me more anyway. They hate you because you always make them study. Just then, everyone started booing her. Miss Garcia is strict, but at least she's serious with teaching and always makes sure we study. You don't teach us anything. That's right! And we all know about Miss Garcia and Mr. Evans already. You're just being a third wheel. No, 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 this can't be true. David, tell these kids that our love is as bright as the sun and, and that we're soulmates. I know you love me. Tell them, David, tell them you love me. Tell them. Unfortunately, my heart has always belonged to Miss Garcia. I was nervous about sharing my feelings with her, but fate brought us together and now I couldn't be happier. Miss Flower's whole expression wilted. Ha, she burst into hysterical tears and ran off. Mom, are you okay? I'm sorry I wasn't there. I'm fine, Callum. Please don't worry. Um, thanks for looking out for my mom. Please, can you take her home for me? Mr. Evans nodded, then took Miss Garcia away. When there were only four of us, actually two of us left, Callum turned to me. You were right. It was so silly of me trying to stop people from falling in love. Because when you fall for someone, you can't help it. What do you mean? I mean, I think I've fallen for you. Still waiting for the day my mom says, It's all fake. We're millionaires. This was just to teach you to be humble. But I know that'll never happen. And I'm still humble. But humble as in humble background. Hi, I'm Addison from Colorado. Ever since my dad passed away when I was seven, we've been broke. And mom got irked whenever I asked her for money. So going to this kind of expensive summer camp seems pretty far-fetched to me. Suddenly, somebody snatched the flyer out of my hands. It's Katie and Candace, the resident mean girls. Girls, are you ready for the trip yet? New hair, new nails, new clothes, all checked. What about you, Addie the Batty? Oops, sorry. We forgot that a poor loser like you could never afford to join in. I forced back tears as they burst out laughing, then left. Addison, are you okay? Don't listen to them. I can help. Stay away from me, Layla. Rich kids like you would never understand. I flicked her hand away and ran off. Hmm, let's see. Mom's getting ready for her night shift and didn't seem in such a bad mood. Maybe now is my chance to drop the question. Mom, I need some money for the school camp. It's the last chance to- We can barely afford the rent this month. Do you know that? Find a way to make money yourself instead of begging me, will you? At this age and you're still so unthoughtful. Unthoughtful? Have you ever been thoughtful of me? I hate how freaking poor our family is. And more than anything else, I hate you. I ran straight to my room, packed a backpack, and quickly left the house. It's already 2 a.m., and this snowstorm is only getting worse. I ignored dozens of calls from mom. There was no way I'd return to that house, ever. Oh, it's freezing. I rummaged through my backpack for my mittens when, oh, Alice in Wonderland, my favorite book. The most beautiful moments in my life suddenly came rushing back to me. It was when my dad read me bedtime stories every night. I'd never forgotten his gentle eyes and warm voice. As I turned the pages in hopes of distracting myself from the storm, my phone notified another call from mom. I have to tell her not to bother me anymore. Hang on, hospital? My mom had an accident at work? I quickly got on my bike to go there, but the barreling storm threw piles of snow against me. I couldn't see anything! Ah! Oh, is it morning already? Contrary to yesterday's blizzard, everything looks as fresh as spring now. But where am I? Suddenly a giant acorn fell and broke in half in which there was a piece of paper. Welcome to Wonderland? Am I dreaming? Wake up, Addison. Mom needs you. Stop wasting time daydreaming like this. Just then, there was a shrill scream. Intruder! Restrain her! Suddenly, two strange men in uniform grabbed my arms, forced me over to a tiny rose arch, and made me go through it. I peered around feeling awestruck. I was in a huge greenhouse, and a well-dressed man was waiting for me. Hello? I'm Edward, the King of Wonderland. Welcome to my kingdom. Dad? Is that Dad? He looks so similar to my dad that I almost blurted it out. He welcomed me warmly with a table of lavish food. I hadn't eaten since last night, so I couldn't help but dig right in. Only when the clock chimed, I became aware of reality. Mom! I needed to get to her! I immediately asked King Edward for the exit. 
This land is beautiful, but a monster rules its gate. I don't know how you got here, but if you want to leave, you'll have to bring that monster three valuable items. Three items? I asked. Yes. Let's see what that is. Then Sir Edward approached the glass door and spoke out loud. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Who is the most handsome of them all? Your Highness, you are the most handsome, the most <sighs> elegant. We wish to be as perfect as you are. <laughs> yeah. If I was you, I'd want to be me too. Now tell me, in order for Addison to leave here, what are the required items? To escape this land, she must acquire one fair lock of Rapunzel's hair, the scarf of Red Riding Hood, and Aladdin's magic lamp. Complete this quest before the clock strikes midnight, or be stuck in this world for an eternity. What? Are you serious? Where am I meant to find those things? Don't worry, I'll send Arthur, my close bodyguard, to accompany you. Just then, a tall, handsome guy about my age appeared. Hey, little girl, there's no time to waste. We need to leave now. Then he threw me a set of clothes and told me to change. After that, we went through the same gate as before. Only this time, it no longer led to a red rose garden, but an underground sewer system. Ew, what are we doing down here? It stinks! Arthur didn't say a word and quickly found a staircase leading above ground. I immediately followed him, and there was a busy street right in front of me. I noticed that everyone was looking at something. It was long, blonde hair falling from a skyscraper's penthouse. Huh? Rapunzel lives in the Empire State Building? Ridiculous! We quickly walked over there, but it was guarded very strictly. How can we get in? That's why I told you to wear this. So, we easily blended in with the maids and waiters and entered the tower. Wow, I've never set foot in such a luxurious house. Who are you? Startled, I turned around to see Rapunzel in the Grimm's fairy tales, standing right in front of me. But wait, why does this girl look familiar? Layla, is that you? Oh goodness, I knew you were rich, but I didn't expect you to live in such a beautiful house. You... you know me? I excitedly showed her our class photos. Layla seemed very interested in them, but she couldn't recall anything, and kept asking me to tell her more stories about school. When I was rambling about our friends to her, Arthur turned to me and whispered, You need to carry on the task now. Oh, it's been two hours already. I chose my words carefully to ask her for a lock of hair, and of course, she said yes. But when we were about to leave, she clung on to me. Please stay here with me. Clothes, shoes, anything here you want, I can give it to you. This one? This one also. All of this luxury stuff will all be mine? Yes, of course! Wake up. Have you forgotten what we came here for? Are you willing to give up on seeing your mother ever again for this? I'm sorry, Layla, but I really have to go. My mom's in danger. Then please take me with you. I can't stay in this hideous house anymore. Come on, you have everything on earth here. It's like heaven. No, it's hell. All this stuff is just meaningless. What I need is freedom, school, friends, and being able to do what I want. Turns out, after her parents' divorce, her dad did everything to win custody and kept her here just to make money from her gorgeous blonde hair. I miss mom. I'd rather live in a small, shabby house than this flashy, cold place. I couldn't leave her here. Suddenly, I remembered how Eugene saves Rapunzel in the movie. So after getting Layla's approval, I cut her hair short and the three of us ran away from this penthouse. We dropped Layla off at school where her mom was already waiting for her. The simplest things like freedom, friends, or someone who truly cares for us are much more valuable than superficial material things. Sadly, I always craved what I didn't have and took what I did have for granted. Let's go. Why are you still standing here? Huh? We have to attend the class too? Ain't no time for this. We gotta find Red Riding Hood. Without a word, Arthur just dragged me away, eventually stopping in front of a girl wearing a scarf on her head. Here she is, the person you need. I waved at her, but she just coldly looked up and asked, What do you want? Huh? Red Riding Hood was none other than Katie? Um, I'll get right to the point. I really need your red scarf. Can you excuse me? This is Gucci. Do you know how much it costs? It's from even the limited edition. Look at you. You probably don't even have a dime to your name. 
Yeah, it is true, but I really need this scarf. I'll do anything you want. All right. Hope you don't regret saying that. Right after that, a luxury car came to pick us up. We stopped at an apple farm, which was familiar to me as it was where my mom worked. Well, I want to bake an apple pie for my mom, so pick me a box of apples. Remember, you have to do it alone. Your friend's out. <laughs> my mom can even pick an average of 12 boxes a day, so one box was just a piece of cake. But who knows her one box was actually a container of 1,000 pounds of apples. Did she want to bake for the whole town? Oh, I'm exhausted. Who on earth could pick apples under this scorching heat for hours? My head started spinning. Losing balance, I fell off the ladder. Luckily, Arthur caught me just in time. Still, your mom does this every day. Can you imagine how hard she works to earn food for the family? Maybe that's why my mom is always tired and cranky. Suddenly, I missed her so much. I finally harvested enough apples and brought them into exchange for the scarf. But Katie still made me choose the 10 most perfect apples out of them. No matter which ones I chose, she gave a dissatisfied scowl. This apple is not okay. Neither is this one. It has a two centimeter scratch. You're too much. It's all the same. No way. Everything for my mom must be the best. She's sick and I need a perfect pie for her. Then Katie told me that when her mom was pregnant, she found out she was sick. The doctor advised her to terminate the pregnancy for her safety, but she refused and risked her life to give birth to Katie. Hearing that story, my eyes just naturally welled up with tears. What now? Are you tired from this little bit of work? No, I just miss my mom so much. I really want to get back to her. I realized that even Katie, the heartless, mean girl, still loves her mom this much. Yet, all I do is ask and plead with my mom. I'm such a terrible child. If you love your mom that much, you know what to do from now on. Help me deliver this gift to your heroic mother, will you? And here, take it and complete the mission. Finally, we've arrived. Our final destination is a museum. Arthur said that there will be a secret room with the magic lamp, but getting the key to that room was already a hassle. There were security lasers all over the place, so we broke in through the ventilation system. Arthur tied a rope around my waist and then slowly dropped me down where the key was. Just a little more and... I got it! But as soon as I touched the key, a drop of my sweat fell, causing the alarm to go off. The guards rushed in from the door, but fortunately, Arthur pulled me up in time. We got out of the ventilation system, but this place was like a maze. Then Arthur pulled me to hide behind a wall. Little by little, his face was getting closer and closer to mine, and my heart was pounding like crazy. Suddenly, the whole wall behind me moved. Turns out there was a secret staircase leading down to the basement, and it took us no time to find the room. Huh? Where's the magic lamp? Arthur approached the only object in the room. It's a projector. He turned it on, then on the white wall appeared the image of my mom, being tired after a long day of work. But when she got home, she still came to check if I was sleeping well. The image of her waking up early to make me my favorite breakfast. Above all, she totally knows about the camping trip and is trying to work overtime so I could join it. Time is running out. You should hurry to go back and hand in these items. I tried to regain my composure, quickly wiped away the tears, and left with Arthur. I'll be back with my mom soon. I'm back! Please take me to the gate! Suddenly, a chiming sound got me frozen. I'm sorry, but time's up! You failed the quest. But why worry? It isn't so bad here. You'll have everything you could ever want. At any cost, please lead me to that monster. I don't need anything else. I just want to be with my mom. I've been thoughtless all this time. I can't leave her when she needs me most. Actually, there is no monster here. It is the greed, selfishness, and ingratitude inside of every one of us. But I can see... You already defeated your monster and learned the lesson. So, you can go back to your mom now. Huh? Everything was so bright. Where was I? Honey, you're awake, thank goodness. Someone squeezed my hand. It was mom. Mom told me how she'd collapsed at work due to overworking. Then she found out I'd fallen off my bike in the snowstorm and knocked myself unconscious. 
Here you go, sweetie. My mom placed some money in my hand. Now you can go on the camping trip. I'm so sorry for upsetting you, and I promise I will work extra hard so you don't have to go without. I burst into <laughs> tears and shook my head. I don't need it. I don't want you working overtime and putting your health at risk for me. Having you healthy and by my side is all I need. Mom, please forgive me for everything. As we pulled apart, I noticed someone standing in the doorway. Arthur. Turns out, it was Arthur who rescued me in the snowstorm. Thank you so much. You're my knight in shining armor. Anytime. I'm just glad you're okay. I mean it. I wouldn't have completed the tasks without you. Huh? What tasks? Looking into his dreamy eyes, I honestly felt like he'd been sent by my dad to help me learn from my mistakes and be grateful for what I had. <laughs> Never mind. I'm just glad you're here. Ugh, we couldn't make a tiny single profit this month. Again? Business is so slow these days. Oh no, it's already past five? Gotta go pick up Lucy. I rushed over to Elena's house. She's my best friend. She often helps take care of my daughter Lucy so I can work extra hours. No matter how tough things were going for me, at least I still have Lucy. Even on the worst days, one look at her angelic smile, and I realize things aren't so bad after all. Why the long face? Has this month been as hard as last month? I nodded, sadly, and entered the house. It's been even worse. I just want to earn enough money to provide a nice life for Lucy, but I'm barely breaking even. I looked over at Lucy, who was playing with her dollies on the living room floor. I plopped down on the sofa while Elena brought me a cup of tea. Things will get better. I just know it. How about I read your tarot cards to see if things will improve for you? Yeah, right. Let's just assume those fortune-telling things are right. I'm not into the spiritual stuff, but Elena swears by it. I suppose it can't hurt to hear what she has to say, right? She made me shuffle the cards, then laid some out on the coffee table in front of me. Oh, that's interesting. Hey, Nora, seems like your life's going to change sooner than you think. Destiny is telling me that it'll be tomorrow after work. At the bakery close to your shop, it looks like you'll meet a man. A rich one. I stare down at the cards. How on earth was she getting all this information from them? Yeah, yeah, whatever. Thanks for looking after Lucy, but I better take her home and make her dinner. Pfft, who would believe those fortune-telling tricks? But, come to think of it, I'm also desperate. With all the lockdowns and Brexit, my little candle shop in the south of England wasn't going so well of late. No amount of two-for-one offers or sales events were helping. Ugh. I'm down to single digits on the money my parents lent me to open up the shop. Then there's Lucy to think of. In her three years of life, she has already been through so much, including her father abandoning us both. I want to provide an amazing life for her, not cause us both to end up homeless. Ugh. I may as well do as Elena said. I mean, it's not like I had anything to lose. So the next day, I closed up the shop early, then with Lucy in tow, walked toward the bakery. Hmm. There didn't seem to be anyone about. Looks like Elena was oh so wrong. Oh, miss, I'm so sorry. I brushed bits of pastry off me and glared at this man. Okay, so it looked like he's only a few years older than me, but why is he wearing such old-fashioned clothes? And what's with his awful hairstyle? This has to be the man Elena was talking about, right? But he's so not my type. But I suppose if dating him changes everything, then... Oh, I'm cute kid. He pointed at Lucy, who was cuddling her favorite doll. Yeah, this is my daughter Lucy. Sometimes I swear she loves that doll more than me. She won't let it out of her sight. He chuckled, then nervously scratched his head and said, You're a good mother, I can tell. Um, are you going this way? He pointed up the street. I nodded, then started walking alongside him. Okay, so he's called Dylan. He's an engineer and he's just moved here for work. We exchanged numbers and you know what? We've been texting quite a lot. Soon we started hanging out, and he's not so bad, albeit a little on the boring side. Lucy seems to adore him, though. He pulls silly faces to make her laugh and buys her sweets. He even took us both to the zoo. Oh, MG, it was so good. And Lucy loved seeing the penguins. So when he told me he liked me and asked me out on a date, I said yes. Okay, so he's not my usual type, but he's rich, caring, and good with Lucy. Besides, it's all too much to be a coincidence, right? 
Elena's tarot reading must have come true, and he's the guy who's going to change my luck. Hey, all the romantic dates out to the restaurants and places were kind of fun. And even better, business was improving. This was great and all, but dating Dylan was getting kind of tiring. I like the guy. He's sweet and kind, but I don't have feelings for him. One time after a delicious meal, he walked me home. Then on my doorstep, he gushed out about how much he liked me, then leaned in for a kiss. Panicked, I darted out of the way, causing him to trip over and almost fall into a bush. Another time, he took my hand when we were walking through the park. I then just stood there while he gave me this soppy look and said, Nora, I really like you, and I know you like me too because you're not letting go of my hand. It made me feel so awkward, so I just pretended I had something in my eye, then changed the subject. Good luck, charm or not, I couldn't carry on like this anymore. So when Dylan surprised me at my shop with a bouquet of flowers which caused a bunch of wasps to swarm around me, I screamed at him, Please? I'm trying to work. Will you just leave me alone? Dylan looked hurt. Then he left. I felt really bad about it, but I just felt so suffocated by him. After that, Dylan and I stopped seeing each other, but as expected, my business started to go downhill again. Ugh, why? Why does it have to be him that makes everything work? But if it's really only Dylan who can help me make money, then maybe, well, then I'd continue dating him until the end of this winter. I mean, I did need money to provide for Lucy. As a peace offering, I decided to buy Dylan his favorite pastry from the bakery and surprise him with it. But as I was walking out of the bakery, I walked straight into someone. Dylan? Turns out he was also planning on surprising me, and he was just getting a pastry for Dutch courage. I invited him into my shop, and he handed me this gross gemstone bracelet. But I forced a smile, told him it was beautiful, and hugged him. Looks like we're back on. That night, I went home and placed the bracelet on the side. But then Lucy got a hold of it, and I noticed one of the gemstones on it was missing. So terrified she'd swallowed it, I spent all evening in A&E. Ugh, oh, turns out it was a false alarm. Ugh, oh, nice gift, Dylan. For the sake of my business, I may have had to date Dylan, but that didn't mean I couldn't see other guys too. So I joined this dating app and started talking to this cute guy called Austin. We gelled so well. So when he asked me out, I said yes. It was a harmless meetup. This wasn't cheating, right? Austin showed up and, well, I didn't want to compare, but Dylan was like a desert, while Austin was definitely the green oasis. But right when Austin and I stepped out of the cafe, we ran into Dylan on the sidewalk with another girl. So, turns out, we both wanted to find someone new? If so, maybe there was no need to wait until winter. So, Dylan insisted on coming round, and naturally, he wanted to know who Austin was. I mentioned how we were both seeing other people, so it was fine. But turns out the girl I saw with him was just a friend. It was time I was honest with him. So I told him how he was a good luck charm for my business, and that's why I continued to date him. He clutched his chest and gave me this heartbroken look. Then he just nodded and left. I felt really bad about it, but at least it was over now, right? I went back to raising Lucy the best I could, trying to salvage my failing business and dating Austin, but in the end, it didn't work out with him. The weird thing is, I found myself thinking about Dylan all the time. Just the cheesy things he said and his quirky ways. I couldn't help but think that if he was here now, life would be so much better. OMG, the realization hit me. I actually have feelings for Dylan. I tried texting and calling him, but he didn't answer. I suppose I couldn't blame him. So I went round to Elena's and confided in her. That's when she took my hands in hers and told me the shocking truth. Dylan is actually my cousin. He, he really has just moved to this town, and he is an engineer. But I, I made the fortune thing up. Actually, Dylan once saw you come over to pick up Lucy and liked you. So I decided to do some matchmaking. What? So all this time, it had all been a lie? My business didn't improve because of Dylan. It had just been a fluke? I was kind of mad with Elena, but I asked her for a favor. I'm so nervous. I got Elena to set this meeting up with Dylan. He thinks he's meeting her, not me. Oh, there he is. Oh, it's you. Dylan, I know I was horrible to you, and I'm sorry. Elena told me everything, and I don't care if my business could be better or worse, even though we both tricked each other. I know that I like you, and I just want you by my side. 
He gave me this questioning look. Then, seeing that I was being serious, he hugged me. So what now? Well, Dylan and I are back together. He's so great with Lucy, and guess what? My business is magically doing amazing again. Hmm. Turns out it has nothing to do with magic or good luck charms or anything to do with Dylan, who not only recommended my little candle shop to all of his friends and clients, but also started up an awesome online marketing campaign for me. Sometimes happiness is right under our noses, but we still try to find it somewhere else. So my advice to you is to learn how to be happy with the things you already have, as trust me, it's only when you lose them that you realize how amazing they were in the first place. How long is this gonna take? So much for taking care of me. Lex, starting today, I'm locking your phone and laptop away. Cruel! Isn't one leg cast enough punishment? Excuse me, you don't deserve to have a say in this. If you hadn't bought our daughter that death trap motorbike in the first place, she'd still be intact. Yeah, sorry for making sure she doesn't grow up boring like her mom. Yeah, another lecture on how irresponsible I was eventually turned into a quarrel between mom and dad instead. They stopped only when mom needed to leave for her business trip in Egypt. I'm done arguing with you. I have a flight to catch. I've got my eye on you, young lady. All the way from Egypt? That's kinda hard. Well, at least Dad's here, so I won't be by myself. The next morning, I woke up to see a note stuck to the fridge. Alex, I'm shooting my new movie in Spain for a few months. There is a strict no phone policy to avoid leaks. So if it isn't urgent, don't call me. Love, Dad. Seriously? Choosing work over me? Why am I still surprised? That's when you get when you have a world-famous actor dad and an award-winning photographer mom. They're rarely home, and whenever they are, they're constantly at each other's throats. All the more reason for me to hang out with my biker gang. I love motorcycles. They're my only getaway. But that's how I messed up my leg. In my defense, I could totally nail that trick and win their stupid bet if it wasn't for that bumpy road. However, not a single one of my homies has checked on me since then. Not even my boyfriend, Blake. But what's really bumming me out is that school's out for summer, yet I can hardly move. So, bored out of my mind, I came up with a new way to entertain myself, which was playing candid camera on this whole suburbia. Thanks to my mom's camera, I had eyes on the newlyweds Cunninghams on the right, the carpenters on the left, a few other houses, and ooh, tiny Timmy across the street. I swear to god, I almost thought some hunky guy had just moved in. My childhood friend, Tiny Timmy, had officially grown into Timothy. He looked just like a muscular version of Timothy Chalamet. Then Tim suddenly sat up and we accidentally made eye contact. Awkward. Looking good, handsome. He's even cuter when he smiles. Oh, he's replying. Even better up close. That's bold, Timmy. Too bad though. Sorry, lame. Tim looks confused at first, then when he saw my cast, he immediately leaves the room. Huh? A broken leg is enough to scare him off? He's lame. Then, the doorbell rang. Hey, that took a while. You're here? Of course, you need to have a closer look, and could use a hand. Or a leg. Yeah, uh, I mean, <clears throat> come help this damsel in distress. From then on, Tim came over every day to help me out around the house. He'd been really helpful and even tried riding my motorcycle so it didn't have to sit idle for too long. Other than that bulked up body, he's still the friend I knew back in the day. We still had so much fun playing video games and watching movies together. You have to watch Bodies Bodies Bodies, it's nuts. Actually, I thought you might be into Ladybird. Such a heartwarming coming of age story. Ew, no way. Timothy Chalamet is in it. Okay, sold. But how do you know that it'd sway me? I just do, like how I know you spy on me from time to time, which by the way, is super creepy. Yeah, right. As if he didn't intentionally leave his blinds open while working out, Mr. Shy Guy. One day, as usual, me and Tim were hanging out when suddenly my dear boyfriend Blake made a noisy entrance. Babe, you won't believe this. There's a raising tournament going on in the Upper West Side. You have to come. What's going on here? Sup. What do you mean, sup? Who's this little brat? Oh, this is Tim. Tim, this is Blake. Say hi. Hi. I don't care. What do you think you're doing? Watch your tongue. 
You've been ignoring me for weeks, and now you show up raving on about some dumb street racing contest? You don't even remember that I broke my leg, do you? But, but, you're mine! Blake was fuming like a bull ready for battle and about to throw hands at Tim, but he stopped his fist midair. A defeated looking Blake fled off as soon as he got out of Tim's grip. Coward. I apologized to Tim for dragging him into this mess, and he was surprisingly cool about it. Just curious, how did Blake and you become a thing? He's the leader of the biker gang, so I thought he was cool. But honestly, I never expected our relationship to last. Just like every other couple's. Exhibit A, my parents. I see. My dad's a good example as well. Then Tim revealed that his dad left his mom for another woman last year, which really upset him. I could relate so much to his situation. Maybe being locked up at home wasn't so bad after all, since we had the chance to catch up on everything. But the following morning, when I was chilling in my room, something horrible caught my eye. Something blonde. It looked like she was returning a hoodie to Tim. What kind of friend borrows a hoodie and acts like that around each other? Let's see what he has to say for himself. Who's that blonde? What was she doing at your place today? What? Who? She might look like strawberry shortcake, but don't be fooled. Whatever love you two might think you have will soon fade. That sweetness will turn sour in no time. <laughs> Tim just burst out laughing. What's so funny? What made you think so? You don't even know Annabelle. Don't believe me? See for yourself. I then showed him all of the secrets I'd uncovered in our seemingly quiet neighborhood. First off, the couple from number 9 were both having affairs. The daughter from number 11 was using her boyfriend to hide her real relationship with another girl. And last but not least, the Carpenters, who seemed like suburban couples goal, actually had a far from blissful life due to Mr. Carpenter's drinking problem. In conclusion, there's no such thing as real love. I see your point, but on the other side of the spectrum, genuine love does exist. Tim points the camera towards the Cunninghams. Hmm, I'm not buying their poster couple act. Then, one day, Tim said he had to work overtime at the library to prepare for an event with, you guessed it, Annabelle only. I had to hide my anger as I watched him drive off with Blondie. With nothing else to do, I decided to watch the Cunninghams. Jeez, how could they seem so lovey-dovey all the time? I wanted to take my mind off of Tim, but the more I observed them, the more I thought about him with that Barbie. That's when I saw a book that Tim borrowed for me from the library. Looks like it's time to return it. I Ubered there, but there are many people here as well. Why did Tim say that the two of them would be here alone? Tim's face turned into the scream when he saw me. Didn't think I could get this far? Hi, don't mind me. I'm just here to return this. You should have just given it to me. Oh god, no. I can see that you're busy with... Annabelle, isn't it? Yeah. How do you know my name? Oh, let's see. You remind me of that creepy doll who's also an absolute nightmare. Tim then immediately dragged me away. See? He's caring for me, not you, Annie. However, the fun was interrupted right away when I saw Blake outside. Time for you to pay. Tim immediately stood between Blake and me, but to our surprise, Blake signaled for his goons hiding close by to show themselves. Clearly outnumbered, I tried to stop the situation from getting worse. Let's be civilized here. We can sort this out without violence. You're right, babe. We can settle this with a bet. Whoever can do the trick that broke Lex's leg and top it off with the Akira slide can have her fair and square. The loser has to back down. First of all, I'm not some kind of trophy. Second of all, that stunt is incredibly dangerous. Right, Tim? Sounds worth it, though. Have both of you lost your minds? Tim went first, and even though he flunked it, he managed to land without a scratch, while Blake landed on his face. Of course, that fiasco got the whole gang so embarrassed, they scrammed immediately. But I was still so annoyed. Congratulations, you won absolutely nothing. Not that I didn't care about him, I just couldn't stand his recklessness anymore. The next day, I was woken up by a doorbell. So, what are you here for? Sorry about last night, but if you stayed longer, I could have told you that I did what I did because I like you. Romantic styles. I don't even remember since when, but I do remember how sad I was when we stopped hanging out. Believe it or not, I started working out just to impress you. Whoa, what? Tim explained that nothing was going on between Annabelle and him. They were simply co-workers. 
and he made up that whole thing about being alone with her at the library to see my reaction. What do you say? I can make you believe in love. Tim, don't be ridiculous. Love isn't anything like the movies. It's merely a temporary chemical reaction in your brain that makes you think you're really feeling it. Come on, just give it a chance. No, look at my parents, your father, all the families in this neighborhood. If you ask me, your feelings for me right now will fade, just like mine with Blake. I'm sorry for wasting your time. I thought I was special enough for you to take a leap of faith. Now I know how wrong I was. He then left without another word. When Tim closed his blinds, honestly, I felt a sting in my chest. This is for the best, right? I can't deny the uneasiness I felt without Tim. It's not that he didn't want us to make up, I just didn't know how. Seeing how happy and smiley he was with her, my uneasy feeling only grew bigger. Is this what they call love? No, 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 it's not real. Happy looking families are not actually happy, and the Cunninghams are just good at faking it. What's that I'm hearing? Are they fighting? I saw the husband suddenly punch the wall with rage, then push the wife. I no longer had eyes on them, but could hear a huge commotion over there. What on earth is going on? Panicked, I called the cops right away. Wait a second, that means their happy marriage really was fake. I excitedly limped across the street to tell Tim about my discovery, then dragged him over to the Cunningham's front lawn. However, when the cops arrived, both of them answered the door perfectly fine. Turns out they already knew about my spying, and were so annoyed by it, they decided to pull a prank on me. Great, my curious neighbors have also witnessed this whole humiliating ordeal. But the worst part was seeing the disappointment on Tim's face. You have to stop being so stubborn. Not every family is like yours. I couldn't say a word, not even when the cops gave me a warning. That night, I tossed and turned as Tim's words wiggled around my mind. Suddenly, something caught my attention. It's from Tim's house. Some flashlights were moving around. I tried calling Tim, but he didn't answer. Of course, he'd be in deep sleep by now. Calling the cops was useless because of that very recent embarrassing incident. That's it, I'm doing it myself. Out there on Tim's front lawn, my heart was beating like crazy. Thieves! Thieves! The startled thieves turned around, so I blared the air horn, then shouted. Freeze! Stay where you are! Hands over your heads! But, obviously, I, a teenager with one working leg, never actually expected any criminal to stand still. They quickly got a hold of me, and right when I thought my life was over, get away from her! Tim, thank goodness! Other neighbors also came and stopped the thieves. Tim called the cops, and this time, they reported to the scene ASAP. Phew, that was insane. Mrs. Jones, Tim's mom, thanked me and invited me to stay the night. It's really nice of her, even though she burst out laughing when I explained the situation with the Cunninghams. When Tim went to grab some drinks for us, she asked me why I was alone in this condition. So, I spilled everything about my family. Contrary to her reaction just now, she showed me sympathy. From her experience, love didn't always have a happy ending, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Tim's dad and I had genuine feelings for each other. It's just that over time, things changed. We're open to accept this and be honest with each other. That's what real love is. I wouldn't change a thing and I would still fall crazily in love with him, despite knowing we would eventually break up. Because that's how I got Tim, the second real love of my life. Her words hit different. Maybe I'd given love a bad name. You're right, love is not at fault. And Tim is so lucky to have a loving mom like you. Meanwhile, my parents don't just hate each other, they put it all on me too. Bet you, even tonight's incident won't make them care. I see where you're coming from, but why don't you just give it a try? Their reactions might surprise you. So, I called them up, and guess what? They both sounded concerned on the phone and said they'd come home as soon as they could. See, I told you so. It's alright now. Timmy, please show Lex where she'll be sleeping. That was really brave of you. Being all heroic out there despite your whole situation. I wouldn't have risked my life if it wasn't for- If it wasn't for what? I'm all ears. For you. I'm sorry I overreacted. The thought of becoming a boring old couple who hate each other bugged me. But then I realized if we were together, we wouldn't have to be that. We could be like the Cunninghams. That doesn't sound too bad now, does it? I guess not. Next morning, I woke up to my parents' call. 
they actually kept their promise this time. My mom explained that she thought dad was home to take care of me, while dad absentmindedly assumed mom only left it a fit of anger and was going to return soon. So they really do care about me, they just have a terrible way of showing it. They stayed together, thinking it would be best for me, but the unending tension and bickering was eating us all up from the inside. This incident opened their eyes, so they agreed to have a peaceful divorce while still looking after me together. I'm finally free from the cast, but I actually feel even more liberated than before. Is this the power of my newfound belief in love? Is it because I've realized that love was around me all along? I'm not sure myself, but who cares? Alex and Timothy signing off. I was at a bustling party, waiting for the one who would decide whether I'd won my cousin's bet or not. Forget your dumb ex. 50 bucks if you get the number of the next guy walking through that door. Oh, here comes my target. I hurriedly approached him, but stumbled and we're kissing. I could feel the taste of grapes on his lips. I immediately pushed him away and stood up. Ah, f phone number, please. The guy looked confused, but still handed me a note. All done. Time to flee the scene! Hi, I'm Agatha, a super introvert who hiccups when nervous. And lucky enough, my kooky cousin dragged me to this crazy party. I ran home to see Mum looking all excited. Oh, my sweet child, you're back already! It's just not my thing, Mom. But cooking is. I have some amazing news! The local soccer club is looking for a chef, so I recommended you! And guess what? They said you can start ASAP! Yes! I've dreamt of becoming a chef since I was little! And now that dream will soon come true! Yahoo! Today's the day. I eagerly arrived at the soccer club, but my jaw <gasps> almost hit the floor when I saw Mateo, my ex! What was he doing here? Flustered, I looked away and saw that guy from the party. What on earth? My life's officially over! After the introduction, I immediately ran to the pitch for some fresh air, but then a hand patted my shoulder. It's him again! No calls or texts? You asked for my number. Are you that shy? <laughs> I'm Killian, by the way. It, it was just a joke. I... Please leave. But then he stepped even closer. Panicked, I pushed him away. Almost made him fall backward. I tried to catch him, but... Not again. This time he smells like chocolate. Oh, you like my lips this much? Why not just say so? <laughs> Holy moly! I ran straight away without looking back. I better stay 10 miles away from him. Suddenly, I saw Mateo passing by. Has he seen anything? But why bother? As if he cared, he dumped me. Okay, Agatha, you're here to work, so focus. But with these jocks around, it's not that easy. They always jump scared me when I was doing my job and made fun of me when I got lost in the changing room. And Killian was always there in time to save me. Everyone, stop. Close your eyes. Then he threw a super stinky, sweaty towel at my face. Ew. Plus, that jerk is the pickiest eater on this planet. He's constantly complaining about my food and demanded I cook him something else. There you go. I'm cutting on starch to build muscles. I'll get rid of the pasta. Oops, I forgot. I'm lactose intolerant. Okay, no cheese. Poor little chicken. I can't eat that. So, are you allergic to the plate too? Meanwhile, other team members were way easier, especially Mateo. We used to date, so I knew his taste pretty well. I gave you some extra pork, your favorite. I don't like pork. I hate pigs. Just then, Killian jumped in. You should focus on me instead. We can discuss my meals privately. Before I could say anything, he already handed me a note. Me and him alone? That's weird. But learning his eating habit would help my job, right? Nope. Big mistake. Killian had an endlessly absurd list of diet restrictions. No more than 2.5 grams of salt a day, mayonnaise on everything, no mushrooms, and spaghetti without tomato sauce? Did he just descend onto Earth? And during the meal, this dude kept smiling and staring at me. You like me or something? You have a veggie on your teeth! Dude! Oh gosh! I immediately ran to the restroom, but Killian caught up with me, holding a ball of wool. Is this yours? I looked down to see a wool thread coming out of my dress's hemline. Ah! Oh gosh, I wish the ground just swallowed me whole right now. 
Surprisingly, Killian put his jacket on me. That was cool. Just then he caught me drooling over him, so I immediately pretended to play with my phone. Haha, <laughs> just want to beat level 9674 in Candy Crush! Strangely, over the next few days, Mateo started being nice to me. Too nice. Your cooking is top-notch as always. Tomorrow, can you make me those delicious vegetable fritters we used to have together? He still remembered that? Boy, he made my heart race. I sprinted to the kitchen and put on music to calm down. Soon, I found myself singing and dancing to my jam. I promise that you'll never find another like me. He he! Ooh, 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 ooh! Mamma mia! How long had he been there? Flustered, I burnt myself. Killian rushed over and held my hand. You okay? You can't even handle yourself? Lenny insisted on finishing my work and even prepared us a dish. Ugh, his broad back. Isn't he quite a charmer when he cooks? We talked a lot, and turns out, we share a ton of things in common. Beneath his teasing, he's actually gentle, caring, and a good listener. I suddenly realized that I had stopped hiccuping since ages. One afternoon, while giving out water, I saw Killian. Oh wow, it's like the sunshine drew a halo around him in his exquisite face. Wait a minute, why was I smiling? Suddenly, a fancy looking girl came over. Killian, why didn't you reply to my messages? You left me hanging all night! Look, I have dark circles now. That's on you! I went to leave, but out of nowhere, Mateo pulled me into a corner. Why were you so close to him? He's only messing with me. Huh? What do you mean? He competes with me in everything. I was cold to you to protect you. Now that he knows you're important to me, he'll harm you to hurt me. I think... He's just trying to be nice? His dad is our club's biggest sponsor. You really think he wants to hang out with people like us while Sloane, whose family owns the largest hospital in the state, is here? I don't know what to believe anymore. However, I had to admit they looked like a perfect couple. While holding a coffee tray one time, I clumsily bumped into Sloane. Are you blind? Why do they let a doofus work here? Come on, Sloane, you bumped into her. He sure seemed sweet to me. Maybe Mateo had misunderstood him. Then once, I spotted the two of them in a quarrel where Killian even pushed Mateo. I tried to intervene, but they brushed me off. What was going on between them? A few days later, I returned from the grocery store to see the head coach in a fit of rage. Explain to me how Mateo is hospitalized for eating your food! What? Why? Stop it! You're fired! My head spun in a million circles! I hadn't done anything wrong! I was packing my things when Sloane appeared. Well, well, well. Looks like little Miss Muffet met her match. Only need some simple tricks to get rid of you and your phony, needy act. Stop dreaming about Killian. You're not at our level. Wait, our? Who's with you? But Sloane just smirked and strutted away. That's when the memory of Killian and Mateo fighting struck my mind. So Killian must have conspired with Sloane to harm Mateo and ruin my career in the process? How could he? Still, he had the cheek to text me as if nothing had happened. Dummy, Agatha. You should have listened to Mateo from the start and stayed away from Killian. I visited Mateo in the hospital, but he coldly shooed me away. It was exactly like the day he dumped me. Today is the city's championship final, and to be honest, I didn't really know why I was here. I looked around for Mateo, but couldn't find him. He might still be sick, so we had to skip this match. On the field, Killian seemed distracted and off his game. What's wrong with him today? Killian, my dear! The lady sitting next to me looked nervous and kept fidgeting. I spoke to her and figured out she was Killian's mom. She told me the shocking news. His little sister was missing. He was blackmailed into making their team lose or he'd never see his sister again. Killian faced the goal, but he didn't kick. Instead, he passed to another player who then scored the goal. The spectators cheered in triumph, while other players celebrated the goal with Killian. Blood seemed to have drained from his face. As predicted, the threats kept coming. I couldn't just sit and pray, so I asked Killian's mom for more clues. She played me the recording of her daughter. I strained my ears to listen and heard a noise. Peekaboo! Peekaboo! I know that sound! It's Mateo's parrot! Ma'am, I know who's behind this! It's Mateo! What? I can excuse fake food poisoning, but how dare he harm my Killian? Ugh, say it again, Sloane. He asked me to fake the medical paper, and I figured it would also kick you out, so I agreed. But what about Killian's sister? That was nothing to do with me, I swear. 
We rushed to Mateo's house. It took him forever to open the door. Mateo, are you okay now? I, I have thought a lot about us and realized how important you are to me. And I don't want to lose you again. Mateo, could you? Oh, please, look at yourself. I just dated you for fun. You truly think I like you? <laughs> and no more pork for me, please. Do you seriously think I'd want you back after the despicable things you did to me and Killian? Killian? Props to that freak for coming at me for telling the truth. So pathetic of him to go for my leftovers. It's you, dummy. Then he blurted out how he cooked up this entire scheme to ruin Killian's career out of the jealousy which was triggered when he visited him in the hospital and told him not to worry about missing the match as they've had a new strategy to cover his absence and the team would perform well anyway. I'm not a pawn that can easily be kicked out. You wish. You are pathetic. Right then, Sloane appeared with the little girl. Let's go. There's no time. Where are you going, Agatha? Admit it, you're still smitten with me. Sorry, the old Agatha can't come to the phone right now. Why? Oh, cause she's dead. After that, we rushed to the stadium. There, I shouted out Killian's name and raised his sister's hands. He seemed surprised to see us, then nodded and smiled. Afterwards, he played like a pro and led his team to victory. He was even awarded player of the match. It's an honor to receive this title, and I want to shout out to someone important. Without her, this wouldn't have happened. Agatha, thank you so much. Countless cameras turned to me. Then he rushed over to drag me to a corner where I told him everything. I know Mateo's a jerk, but I didn't expect him to be that bad. But no worries. Let's see how he likes being permanently banned from the soccer club. Agatha, I, um, want to tell you that I found something just as important as soccer. You. He then grabbed my face and pressed his lips against mine. Finally, we had a legit kiss, and it was magical. Hey, I'm Esther of the rising TikTok channel at Aesthetic, where I share my passion for fashion. Look at my newest design. Cool, huh? Who would have thought newspaper was a great material for making dresses? I was trying one on and posing for photos when I heard a knock on my door. That's my mom and dad. Esther, we have some good news. We're moving. What? I'm being transferred to another branch in San Francisco. Can you believe we'll be living in that sunny city? No, no, we can't move. I'm, I'm a senior already. All my friends are here. Mom! Just get over it and start packing. This is our one chance at a better life. Why can't they understand that I'm not simply shy, but actually have major social anxiety? It's a real thing that I can't just get over. That's also why my 2 million TikTok followers still haven't seen my face yet. I could barely handle the stress from across the screen, never mind being alone in a brand new school full of strangers. Oh gosh, this place must be twice as big as my old school. It's gonna take forever to find the bathroom. Man, it feels like a thousand eyes are on me. Or maybe not, but I can't risk looking around. What if someone makes eye contact? My palms are sweaty, my heartbeat is so loud I can hardly hear anything else. But then, some hot couple walked in and literally ate up the entire hallway's attention. Good, surely no one would notice me now. It was so exhausting running from one class to the next. Now, where do I sit? I walked over to a table, but no one batted an eye. I wasn't sure if I should sit down or not, when suddenly, a pretty girl appeared. Sky blue. Sorry? Anyway, you're new, right? I'm Jojo, class president. Come sit with us. I followed her to another table. Hi guys, got space for two more? Yeah, sure, the more the merrier. Oh no, that girl doesn't sound too happy about having me here. But it would be too awkward to just get up and leave. Uh, hi, I'm Esther. Hey, didn't know they serve fresh tomatoes here. Finish your lunch, Amanda. We have homework to do. Phew, yeah, think about your homework, guys. Don't mind me. I got to know the school layout a bit better, so the next day wasn't as hard. Until I saw some girl waving at me. She looked like Jojo, but her eyes weren't blue. Must be her twin sister or a doppelganger waving at someone behind me. You really just got ghosted in real life? And you call yourself class president? I flinched. 
So that actually was the class president from yesterday? How strange! Then, my absolute worst nightmare came true in biology class. We had to work in pairs. Okay, which group would like a new member? Anyone? Please, help a girl out. I see you're in a desperate need of a partner, Zeke. Why don't you raise your hand so Esther can see where you are? I saw an arm at the back of the class, so I walked towards it. Hi, newbie. Esther, right? My name is... Baby Blue Emerald Green? Hey, do my eyes look funny to you, new girl? Jeez, I didn't mean to upset him. So I ended up explaining that I'd had issues with eye contact since I was little. So my mom made me pay attention to strangers' eye colors to make it seem like I looked them in the eye. She even asked me what color their eyes were afterwards to make sure I did what she asked. Well, even though I did, that trick never actually helped me get over my social anxiety. In fact, I usually only notice other people's eye color, not their names or how the rest of their faces look. You're weird, but I believe you. I don't like interacting with other humans either. They tend to pick on me because of my eyes. It shouldn't come as a surprise that us shy kids got along pretty well. Zeke taught me biology and chemistry after class, while I helped him with his Spanish homework. Thanks to him, lunchtime isn't as stressful anymore. We could chat away about anime for hours, and he's supportive of my fashion obsession. So I felt comfortable enough to tell him about my TikTok account. He still liked to tease me from time to time, though. Eye reader, what color are their eyes? You know, the powerhouses, Colin and Amanda over there? No way! I never look pretty guys in the eye, cause I'll immediately turn into a walking tomato. Same thing for hot girls. I don't want them to think I'm trying to pick a fight with them or something. You're that avoidant? Have you ever made eye contact with anyone here except me? Yep, Jojo, the blue-eyed girl. Blue? You know her eyes are brown, right? She likes wearing contacts. Jojo changes her eye color, hair, and accessories every week. She's quite a chameleon. Too bad she seems so smitten with that boring guy Colin Gray. Wow, someone clearly has a crush on Jojo. <laughs> but actually, I think Z could be quite a catch too, if he wasn't so insecure about his heterochromia. Speaking of Jojo, have you heard about her Halloween party? What about it? Well, I thought about going, but I have no costume. Forget it. It's not like she'd notice me there anyway. No! You should definitely go! I can help in the costume department! So, here we are! I'd successfully transformed my timid friend into King Lelouch. Who else but Zeke and his unique eye colors could pull this off? As his personal stylist, he insisted I come with him. I'm not even dressed up though. Oh man, I can hear my heart pounding already thinking about how many people will be in there. But, I'm not the type to abandon my friend. So, let's go. As soon as everyone saw his majesty, they went silent, then erupted when he flipped his cape. Look at him! <laughs> his ego must be through the roof right now. I then swiftly stepped back to a corner. So, this is what a house party is like. Suddenly, I overheard two girls talking. Aesthetic is definitely from our school, or Zeke had some connections. Yeah, I swear this is the exact same outfit Aesthetic has been prepping on her channel. Oh, come on. There could be hundreds of Lelouch costumes during this spooky season. Girls, please stop speculating. Aesthetic is totally not from this school. I- Hey there, what's your costume? A shy, cute girl? I- I- um, nice Stranger Things shirt. Yeah, I look even better than Eddie, don't I? Um, yeah, totes. So I have this thing. Gotta go, bye! Then they ran straight out of there. That was too much socializing for one day. After that party, I noticed Zeke started to hang out with Jojo and became much more confident. I was happy for him, but he was no longer the same guy. One time, we agreed to study together in the library, but he stood me up. When we met the following day, he said he hadn't touched his homework yet because he was out with Jojo. And then, asked to copy mine. Sure, fine. But when he was done, he flat out refused to teach me chemistry as he was too busy. Things were that way for a while, until today when I found out the shocking truth. Esther, I only keep her around to do my Spanish homework. You know she's a total buzzkill. Excuse me? Your free homework trial has expired. So much for we're friends, huh? Everyone, look! Someone finally came to some self-realization. How adorable! <laughs> Tell them, Zeke! Did you know she has to make her own clothes? Pathetic! Who was this guy? He's the total opposite of the boy I'd got to know over the past couple of months. Am I in the upside down? It's over. Zeke and I were practically strangers now. Back to my gloomy and lonely life.
Annoyingly, I saw Zeke again that day, this time on the school paper. This smug jerk gave an interview on the now famous Lelouch look. However, in that article, Jojo claimed to be aesthetic, the creator behind that costume, while Zeke backed up her entire story. What in the world? And Jojo even showed some of the sketches that I shared on my account. I was furious and went to confront Jojo, but somehow she didn't seem to be faced at all. <laughs> So what if you're the real aesthetic? I can be her too, don't you think? If you have a problem with that, then let's go sort it out. Attention everyone! This is Esther. You probably don't know her, but who cares? She has something to share. The floor is yours, girl. Everyone's gaze turned towards me. Holy moly, where should I look? Why is this so different from talking to the camera? My entire body went into crisis mode. God no, something's coming up. Run! Although I calmed myself down, I couldn't face anyone right now. This is the worst day of my life. Suddenly, someone tapped my shoulder. Amanda? What does this social butterfly want? Did she just ask me if I was okay? Okay? No, I'm not okay. Why is it that girls like you and Jojo, who already have everything, always want to take away everything? Hey, I'm just trying to be nice here. If it wasn't for my silly little friend... What? What are you talking about? Never mind. Sorry, but you don't seem okay. Come with me. I think I know how to make you feel better. Come on. Skipping one class won't kill you, but bad mental health will. I wiped away my tears and went with Amanda, even though I barely knew her. But she had a point. The last thing I need right now is a stuffy classroom. Here it is. Go inside. There'll be someone who can help you. That's weird, but all right. I stepped inside, and it was like being hugged by the smells of wood and paper. It felt healing, for sure. I was browsing through the store, then saw Colin walk over. Startled, I stuck my face into an empty slot on a bookshelf to avoid him, but... <coughs> this place is filled with dust! Surprisingly, Colin only smiled and gently wiped the dust off my face. Um, if you're looking for your girlfriend, Amanda just left. She's not my girlfriend. And actually, I asked her to bring you here. Wh what Why? Just calm down. I got you something. How do you know my favorite genre? Because I've seen you read to calm yourself down before. Turns out, Colin had been observing me from a distance for some time, so he even remembered what I usually read. He was hesitant to talk to me though, afraid that all the unwanted attention he might attract would make me feel uncomfortable. But now, everyone knows I like you. Sorry about that. Don't be. It's my fault and my anxieties. I can help you with that. Esther, would you go to prom with me? How will that help? It will. Trust me. Oh, his eyes are… gray? I realized I've been talking to him all this time just fine without using the old trick. What if this guy really could help me? On prom night, Colin drove me there. While he was parking his car, I waited in front of the venue. Out of nowhere, Zeke approached me. Listen, there's not much time. You gotta listen to me. Jojo plans to give you an award, but it's only to get you to stand on the X mark on the stage where the trap door is. She wants to humiliate you in front of the entire school because you're with the guy she likes, so be careful. What game are you trying to play here? Why are you telling me this? I want to make things right. Jojo took advantage of my feelings for her, and I was too blind to see that she only liked Colin, and she's been using me to hurt you. This is my chance to make it up to you, so please, don't go up there. It's a trap. Stop it already. I won't let you make a fool of me again. Right on time, Colin came to the rescue. Haven't you done enough? Stay away from her. I'm truly sorry, Esther. Inside, we were greeted by Amanda. Congrats, bro. I'm finally free from the Collins Rumor Girlfriend label. Jojo must be green with envy seeing how cute you two are together. Right. She's here, as well as hundreds of other people. Nope, I can't do this. I quickly crawled under a table and curled up into a ball. Still, Colin remained patient. You are absolutely stunning tonight. Honestly, your dress is amazing. Come out. Let the whole world see you. The world will only laugh in my face. Okay, then let me join you. It's actually quite cozy down here. What are you doing? Well, tonight is a special night, and my date's a special girl. So I figured we could totally enjoy it in an unusual way. I feel like my insides just turned into a hot, liquidy mess. Who would have thought that I could meet someone who goes out of their way to make me happy? We chatted for a while, then noticed that the lights outside were dimmed for the slow dance. Let's go. Hand in hand, Colin and I swayed to the melody, feeling like we were the only people in the room. 
Then, the music suddenly stopped. They were about to present tonight's awards for remarkable students. And now, best dressed of the night award goes to Esther Crawford. No way. What Zeke said immediately came to my mind. I turned around to see Zeke looking concerned and shaking his head. Maybe he'd been telling the truth after all. You don't have to go up there if you don't feel like it. Colin was as understanding as always. But then I saw Jojo's smug face. I couldn't let her win again. So I mustered all my courage and stepped onto the stage, but steered clear of the X mark Zeke mentioned. Thank you, everybody. But I believe another person deserves this award much more than me. She's none other than our hardworking class president, Jojo. That's so sweet of you, but it's yours. Please, step up to receive it. You mean here? No, one step forward. Here, Jojo became impatient and rushed towards me. No, you have to stand here! Right back at you, Jojo. Have a taste of your own medicine. Now that's some headline material for the school paper. <laughs> so, today is the day. My long overdue face reveal. This is such a beautiful dress, right guys? If you're wondering who this strange girl is, hi, I'm Esther and I'm the person behind at Aesthetic. This dress right here, it's what I wore to senior prom. Settle in, I'm doing a face reveal and story time video today.